Greetings everyone, Brandy Douglas, Senior Communications Associate with Indian Collective and we're here today at the final stop of the Red Road to DC totem pole journey. I'm so excited to be here, so happy for all of you to be here and we're going to be interviewing a lot of uh, leaders, tribal leaders and allies and community members today and we wanted to go ahead and step over here and get our first interview. Sir, could you tell us what your name is, where you're from and what you hope to accomplish today? Yeah, uh, Woody Lee in Seattle. Uh, I am the member of the Navajo Nation. I am here as a uh, organization representative. I'm executive director for Utah to Nebuchadnezzar, and we are really into uh, participating in this journey uh, of the totem pole delivering here to our honorable and cousin, Mr. Holland. Uh, and so with that, uh, from Utah to Nebuchadnezzar, we really encourage and support the creation of uh, noticing and recognizing and permanently establishing these places of our sacred native sacred sites and such as the Bears Ears and Chaco Canyon within our area and then there's a countless of others that are across the nation that we'd like to preserve here going forward and all the lessons learned of when the first Columbus came ever since then to hear those or lessons learned moving forward we would like to heal uh, from all over the people that are here and moving forward that we all are uh, be a salad and a salad bowl so rather than being a, a melting into a melting pot so with that I do thank you and let's all enjoy this and move forward in in a family harmony sort of way thank you yes Long enough? that's great thank you so much how do I Oh, we're just live now. We just walk around. Show us the totem pole. Let's go over here. Let's check out the totem pole. I'm going to try to catch Judith if we want. This is your first time seeing it, right? Mm hmm. This is my first time seeing it. Um, up close in person, I've been hearing about folks. Uh, visiting the different sacred sites and how how spiritual a moment it is to put your hand on the totem pole. Um, of course, all those prayers and blessings have been carried here with the totem pole. We have a nice crowd gathering here. Um, this is going to be such a beautiful event, and we hope that this administration um, hears the the demands and requests of these different nations. Lots of lots of folks here covering <laughs> this event. Okay. Okay. There you go. Hi. Nice to meet you. Hi. Uh, my name is Whitney Gravel. I'm president of Bay Mills Indian Community. Can you tell us a little bit by, about why you're here and what you hope to accomplish? Yeah, I'm here representing uh, Bay Mills in order to represent the waters of our Great Lakes. Uh, the Black Snake and Bridges Line 5 currently runs through our treaty ceded territory. It's an oil pipeline that has spilled more than 1.1 million gallons of crude oil and natural gas into our waterways, our environment, our habitats upon which my people rely on our treaty protected resources that's where they reside so we're here to call upon the Biden administration to stop these oil pipelines and to honor treaties that they have with indigenous tribal nations absolutely thank you so much for sharing yeah, thank you miigwech
What's it, like, you know, what's it like to be here? Like, what's it like to come all this way? Is the totem pole stopped in, in your territory? Yeah, so the totem pole actually had its last journey at the Straits of Mackinac, where we performed ceremony in order to honor our creation story, which takes place in the Straits area. So coming out here with the totem pole and being part of that medicine, that good energy and that journey, we're hoping to carry that not only from our lands, but to these lands and have actual effective change here with the federal government. So it's been an honor and a blessing to be with the totem pole people. They are inspiring the Lummi Nation and they are serving an example for all of us on how we can unite and come together in order to protect our sacred places. Absolutely, this is definitely a collaborative effort and it's so amazing to have you here, all the delegations as well. It's a beautiful, beautiful day. Yeah, miigwech for coming. Thank you for being here with us. So. Thank you. What's this truck up? Security's rolling in. Okay. Don't forget. Thanks everyone for being here and joining us today on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And don't forget, forget to hit follow, like, and share. Okay. Uh. <laughs> My mind sometimes goes whoop. Oh no, for sure. It's also hot. Look at the the obelisk stuff in the distance there. Do you have a minute? Yes. Um, you can stand. Uh, <laughs> do you want them standing over there? Oh, you know what? You want one? Yeah, come on, come on over here. I'll be, I'll be back at when she's... When they're done? Okay, okay. Monument in the background? Okay, I got Okay, so they're going to go? You're good to go? Yeah. We're just going the whole time. Hi, you two. Can you two introduce yourselves and tell us where you're coming from? Shoji Lexine Dementif Oji. Gutraja Gutsan Eatley. Uh, Shoji Madison Wheel Audrey Beaver Gutsan Eatley. Thank you so much. What does this day mean to both of you? Um, exciting, isn't it? Yeah. It's a powerful day. Lots of changes that can happen for your community. Yeah. Uh, the what? Lots of changes that can happen for your community. Probably like more people who can speak about the land. Yeah. And that's powerful to have have a voice for your communities. Yeah. How does it feel being here as a youth? Um, for the future generations. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm so excited to see you both here. Um, there's going to be lots more events, lots more talking. I hope you're inspired. We're so happy to have you here and to see you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything else you want to say? Just like, what brought you out here? Anything like that? Uh, I didn't know. Oh, yeah. Oh. Well, thank you. Thank you. I didn't know. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a Thanks good for day. Being here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I get it. I feel it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot going on. Oh, there are camera, you know, it's putting cameras in those spaces. I'm always following you guys. I really love the work you guys are doing. Yeah, how's this day uh, making you feel? It's a really powerful day, isn't it? Oh, I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's something I just want to say hi. I just wanted to. Yeah, like, I'm always. <laughs> Yeah, this is important. This is like, this is historical, you know, uh, generations, I guess. And to to me, this this means a lot because, uh, you know, we 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 have a we have an allotment right here. That, that's that, that's my that's that's my my family's allotment, 160 acres, and uh, right over here is Chaco Canyon, you know, and and in the whole region. They're, they are uh, uh, oil and gas industry is uh, destroying the land, you know. And, and when, when it came to Chaco, we we you know it was it was 
it brought everybody together. A lot of relatives that we haven't seen for, you know, since COVID, and and it, 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 this is this is really uniting the community behind the position that we 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 gotta um, we gotta uh, um, st organize, and we have to, you know, take take this opportunity to to elevate our, our, our concerns, you know, because, because, uh, the fact is that, that we're, 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 the oil and gas is, is, is operating. We still got relatives that don't have water, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they, they, they don't have running water. People got to truck in the water. They don't have electricity <laughs> still. <laughs> You know, and, and and but yeah, industry can come in and set up operations and and uh, and harm harm you know the community. They're they're not good neighbors. <laughs> you know, if if you go over there and you could you could smell it, it, it it's. You know, so many people have health health problems in my community, and it's it's time we have a you know, this is about like going back to who we are as as people as indigenous people. You know, we have to start like a, a, a re regenerative, you know, uh, solution, because <laughs> because what what's happening is is you're hearing a lot of false solutions. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> Yes. Oh, from I'm from Shiprock. My, my name is Joseph. I'm the Dine Energy Organizer for Nava Education Project. And I do a lot of renewable energy uh, out outreach uh, on the Navajo Nation. I also just won a national award. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I won the Dr. Espanola Jackson Solar Justice Award for the work that I'm doing uh, on the Navajo Nation. So. You're doing some phenomenal work. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you thank so much. You. Thanks for walking up. And, uh, thanks for the interview. I know you just wanted to say hi. Solomon from the Lemmy Nation. Hey, thank you. Oh. Greetings. Greetings. Thank you so much for meeting with us today. If you could tell us your name, where you're coming from, and why this day is so powerful for you. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Lawrence Solomon. I'm the chairman of Lemmy Nation. I'm happy to be here. Uh, this is uh, very important, what's taking place here today. Uh, we see the totem pole here. Now the totem pole came from Lummi Nation all the way to the steps of Washington, D.C. Now really proud of our crew. Some of the crew is over there and um, they made the journey. Uh, just like all journeys, it's a, it's a journey, you know. Uh, across Indian country, they gained a lot of support and the messages that they're taking across. Uh, a lot of the Indian issues that are taking place in the United States and uh, gaining a lot of support for their, uh, this one. Uh, is about the sacred sites. Um, uh, we have uh, some issues in Lummi Nation in our territory, in our usual and accustomed areas. Uh, Cherry Point, in Lummi language, we call it Hochiichen. And um, currently, you know, we still, uh, you know, we feel like it's being attacked from all angles. It's a, it feels, it's a deep water port. And um, there's, uh, currently there's some docks there, but um, we, we do our, the best we can to protect our sacred sites. We have an ancient villages there uh, where our people are buried, where our people used to live, and it's sacred to us. And to uh, Across Indian country, this is taking place, and it's a uh, good message that the, the crew is taking across the country. I really hope you know that you know we grab the attention and get their attention about what's taking place across any country, and to address the issues that are currently taking place and uh, uh, you know protect our sacred sites, uh, the whole United States. You know this is uh, it was once uh, just inhabited by the Native Americans, and um, you know it's all sacred to us. But uh, I want to thank you. You know I'm really happy to uh, be here with everybody. Thank you so much, Chairman. This is the 
women's long skirt top hat society. They're a, a water women's society. Ladies, head over here, please. Hello, everyone. Got everybody. I'd love to get everyone's names just for an introduction and, and let us know where you're all coming from. I'm Second Water Woman. My English name is Great Grandmother Mary Lyons. I'm First Nations, Ojibwe, and my mother is stateside in Shinabe. Um, we reside in Minnesota. This is my family. Hi, I'm Francisca Smith and Wanu Smith. I come from the White Earth Reservation. Hello, this is uh, my name is Keely Smith. This is my daughter, Mani Dugiza Sunzikwe, and we are Anishinaabe from the Leech Lake Nation, Minnesota. Hi, I'm Zyra Smith. I'm Anishinaabe from White Earth. Hi, my name is Lily Smith. Hi, my name is Fonda Smith, and I'm Anishinaabe from the Leech Lake Reservation. Hi, my name is Ruby Smith and I'm Anishinaabe from the White Earth uh, Reservation. Thank you. For anyone that wants to share, what does this day mean to all of you? Oh, well, not me, I'll just pick right away for it, right? Listen, <clears throat> we are the uh, Top Hat Long Skirts Society, we're Medewin, and we stand with the elements, you know. We uh, came from creation and we had this original agreement and we came and we swam in our mother's wombs for up to nine months in the water and when we took that breath of life we took an air and with that air we felt the warmth and that was fire and we planted our feet and we nourished on mother earth those are four elements and those four elements show us no prejudice that's everything in here is a spirit and that's what it's made up of and we sat silent for um, a really a long time and uh, great-great-grandmother finally said about almost 10 years ago we can come forth and uh, speak of who we are as Madewans. Um, and there's many Madewans and everybody brings beautiful messages but our particular house of where we're at the Long Skirt Top Hat Society we really stand with those elements in that spiritual being. Um, some say is this our regalia dress? We dress mostly like this at all times. Um, but what we want to speak about to bring truth to it is because we're in a drought and part of who we are in our existence here on this planet, the water's being affected and when the water's affected, the air is being affected. When the air is being affected, the fire is being affected. It doesn't mean Mother Earth is going to just go kaput on us. It just means that she gave us a small portion of her to, to prove to her that we can be good people and so far we haven't been doing that. So we rise up and we have to stand for those elements. And those elements aren't just for Anishinaabe, for indigenous peoples or the peoples around the world in this stuff. This is for all people. Our planet is made up of mostly water, but there's very little bit that, are, that can sustain us in these plant lives and our relatives in the water and out there. So if that goes, we all go. So it's very important that we we come and we make this be heard in that there because we took our cloaks, cloaks off. We're not invisible anymore. We are the seeds of the ancestors that are of this original ground. This, we're the original gardeners of this land. So this is very important that we bring this forth because, you know, if there's going to be foreigners that come in and they don't know what our lands and our gardens are about, they're not going to care for it. And as we're witnessing it today, this stands true. This is so we're here to let the world know and out there too that we're not going to stand and let somebody come in and bully us from Canada that has billions and billions of dollars to just ravage and rape Mother Earth. We won't stand for it. So we have to stand up in order to, to let these little ones have a voice. You know, we became lazy, lazy people and we took in the, the we, were, we bought and we just went. You know, just that real easy route, and then this is the, the aftermath of it. And so when we leave, we're going to leave our destruction to our grandchildren. And now our grandchildren are saying, we're not going to carry your weight. We're going to stand within our truth. We're going to clean up your mess, and we're going to go back to the organics of life. You see, a hundred years ago, we never had a water bill. You see, a hundred years ago, we never had, you know, a light bill, a gas bill. And so those are the elements, and somehow mankind prostituted it. And so what we have to bring forth in this stuff, our organic way of our ancestors. Otherwise, we fail too. 
I hope that makes sense. But this is why we are here. Absolutely. Such an important message. And the cloak is off. We're here. We're going to make some noise. Does anybody else want to say anything? Water is life. Yeah. Yay. Water is life, everyone. Yeah, you were talking about the, the song, like the Line 3 pipeline, right? Yeah. Like the Ember and the Canadian company was the Ember. That's where we're from. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're from that territory with Winona. I thought Winona was hopefully going to be here today and out there, but we, we try to bring this awareness. Um, we just made this uh, healing journey from Minnesota through California and this stuff to be with uh, the Dene Prayer Runners. My son, Jed, I don't know where is he at, someplace here. He was with them and they went up from um, Los Angeles and they ran the 215 for the 215 children that was resurrected in Canada and was brought into life. And within those prayers in each step of the way, it was very hot, 108 degrees, and they they went up and we did water ceremonies on Mount Whitney. And from Mount Whitney, uh, the first landing in out there where we did the water ceremonies, they continued on and the other ladies went up and they summited on the highest peak and when we were done we came down took those ceremonies and this stuff took them down to the lower part of the station out there through you know arizona all through the hopi navajo and out there and helping them with prayers too because they're our relatives we went into texas where the worst rape of the ground is possibly there so we lay our prayers down there and we made our way back up to minnesota we wanted to get with this totem because this totem has sacredness in it and it has an awareness and it's part of the prophecies. So once we did that, we came out to support this. And so we're on our third leg here and our final leg will be in Carlisle where we will rest our bundles and this stuff and say the prayers for those children yet to come home and prayers for many of our people that are yet to come home. Because see, this land here is sacred and people are just not paying attention. You know, if we went to another part of the world as us natives here and did what they did to us, they would ostracize us and put us in jail or whatever it is. But here, in our own homelands, we're the original garters, you know, that was their obligation to take care of it. But to remind also a lot of the visitors that came in through the footprints of their ancestors, they had the same fight as ours, you know, but they seem to forget it. So when we say, where are you from? We always say to the people, that came into this way, the colonizers, you know, people that were, you know, the, the people that are not from this land, they should remember those ancestors because those ancestors, you know, went through hell to make sure that everybody is here today. So it's very, very uh, important. So sing your ancestor songs, no matter where you are, sing their gardens, know the lands, you know, know your plant life and this stuff. And once you do that, your ancestors are gonna wake up in you. You see our ancestors are in us and all around us. There just isn't us that are standing here. We come with millions. We come with that VA beginning. So I want to say to you, miigwech. Thank you. Thank I you hope so that's much. good. Mm. Miigwech, miigwech. Thank you. Okay. Teresa Sheldon, she's going to talk about the power of the native vote with all of the work that's happening here today. Do you have a preference where I stand? Oh, no. Right here. It's fine. We're all twist. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Can you tell me your name, where you're from, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the power of the native vote? Right? Absolutely. So I'm Hasle Hale, Teresa Sheldon Seedsta, Tuel Chadu Flalep. I'm Teresa Sheldon from Tulalip Tribes, and I also work at the DNC as the Native American Political Director. Talk a little bit about the power of the native vote, how you're trying to invoke that message today and going forward. Yeah, so what significance as Native Americans, we're born with inherent and reserved rights. So as a political class of people, we're constantly uh, disregarded, dis you know, put in the back and silenced. And, and we're constantly, um, yet our treaties are what is protecting Mother Earth. And so the political power that we carry is in our vote, not only in our nations, but in our individual votes. And so as Native people, we're constantly trying to get out the Native vote, get people to, um, you know, come in, learn with us, and participate. And so what is really significant is you see the power of the vote because you have over 42 states who have introduced uh, voter suppression bills. And of those, every single battleground state has had voter suppression bills. And those states include tribes. So not only are we talking about Florida, Georgia, Michigan, Wisconsin, Arizona, Nevada, 
So the only way to get win elections is to cheat. <laughs> So what we are doing is really talking out about voter suppression and the need um, for what those elections will look like in 2022 and what the elections will look like in 2024 um, because those changes have already occurred. And so it's all across the spectrum from having to have IDs, having to have a permanent address, not being able to be flexible on polling locations and um, or vote by mail. And so it's just every aspect of voting is under attack right now. And do you find that communities are aware of the the process to vote or all those, you know, all those different components when it comes to trying to vote? Well, the problem is now they changed. So everybody who voted for the 2020 um, election, that process may have changed now because of their state legislature. So then it's up to your secretary of state to notify the citizens and to notify voters what is going to be different for the next one. Whether or not that happens is like, you know, so that's how they're able to avoid and disregard us and silence us by changing the rules, not educating people on the rule change. And then you're just you show up to vote and your polling place is no longer a polling place where your ID is no longer efficient. You need a state ID and not a tribal ID. And so it's they're articulate at picking apart what will attack uh, Native Americans and people of color's voting rights. And so it's intentional, it's on purpose, and we can't allow it. Absolutely. I mean, it almost seems like, you know, a tactic, right? Yeah. To, to suppress the Native vote. Yeah. You know what? Thank you so much for all the work that you're doing with the vote. What does it feel like to be here today with the totem? Oh, it's powerful. So this totem really came about um, because of the election. And so on November, when the election was called for the Biden-Harris administration, that call to remind um, the administration of the government-to-government -government responsibility that the treaties go to the next administration. You know, so Biden and Harris is responsible for upholding and, and the treaty rights of, of tribes. So the poll represents not just honoring treaties, but it also represents the federal policies that are impacting us. So missing murdered indigenous women and girls, the death of all of our indigenous children from boarding schools, protecting sacred places, water is life. Um, there's no surprise that we're constantly fighting to protect the environment. And so this poll is able to articulate policy papers into art. And so our artists are so important in the storytelling. And the storytelling is that the federal laws are impacting our lives daily. And we know that as Native people. We feel it and, and we uh, experience it every day in our education and the lack of access to our traditional gathering places and sacred places. And so that's the beauty of this um, story poll is bringing us into the federal policy uh, through art and storytelling. Absolutely. And, and what would you want this administration to hear if you were to say one thing to them about this totem, about voting in Indian country? What would you want them to hear? The thing is, uh, whatever a tribal position is, like stand with tribes because we are right. So we literally have the treaty on our side and the law on our side. And we're constantly having to fight states and constantly having to fight counties, private corporations who believe less than. And so it's stand with tribes. We know what we're talking about when we're talking about the water and we're talking about the change of our plants and our medicines. Like we, we understand that and we have our own expertise and our own knowledge, sacred knowledge to know when enough is enough and we're at that breaking point. And so uh, we need help, and, um, and that's living up to that trust responsibility of protection and carrying out that responsibility. Absolutely. Thank you so much for all that, all useful information, tying it all together beautifully. Thank you again. Yeah, thank you. Take good seat. Okay. All right. Oh. Awesome. We are here. Just for folks tuning in, we're here at the end of the Red Road to DC totem pole journey, meeting with allies, meeting with tribal leaders, community members. We're also talking about the Respect Act regarding free prior and informed consent. Um, we're gonna have some wonderful speakers uh, coming up later on in the program. So I'm good. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Um, so 
uh, talk to talk to uh, the audience about welcoming everyone to your, your homeland. Tell me who you are. Hello and welcome everybody to our beautiful homeland of the Piscataway Indigenous people. It's such an honor and I'm so delighted to, that everyone took a long journey to be here and be present on this ground. The soil, the earth, the, the capital, which uh, if you look behind you, that was at one time our meeting place when we used to have our conferences and uh, the White House behind that. And all of these buildings and structures are all part of where our ancestors lived. And uh, along the uh, beautiful Potomac River here, the um, Anacostia River that runs through the District of Columbia, that blends into the beautiful Potomac River, that blends into the Chesapeake Bay. These waters provided all our food at one time, and I wish they still could now. But because our waters are polluted and, and we're trying to do everything we can to bring our herring and the shad uh, fish back and uh, a healthy uh, environment uh, so we can live like we did uh, many, many years ago. Uh, I am the daughter of the late Chief Turkey Tayak. Uh, my father's buried on our Piscataway Indian burial grounds which is right across the Potomac River in Akakeek, Maryland. It also uh, runs along the Potomac River. And to the right of my father's resting place is Mount Vernon across that part of the Potomac River on the Virginia side. It's an honor to be here today and I welcome everyone, uh, everyone to feel our spirit, uh, to learn more about our people, our ancestors, and it blend in with our native people. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank what you. does it feel? Oh, thank you so much. We're so happy to be here. Thank you for welcoming us. Thank you so much. It's an honor. Thank you. How are you doing? Hi, Chief. Can you go ahead and just say your name, where you're coming from, and then what this day means for you? Okay. My name is Chief Jesse James Swan Jr. I'm from the Piscataway Kanoi Tribe. Today is an honor for our tribe to have the totem to be here present with the totem and what it represents in the healing. The Piscataways welcome everybody here and it's a pleasure for us to be here and we're grateful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Are you guys ready to come up? Yeah. Oh, you remember telling you my name? I believe you did do an introduction, yes. Thank yeah, you so much. I'm actually the Ma Julie Tayaki. It's the matriarch of the Piscataway Indian Nation. Okay, y'all come on. Uh, yes. So, my head is like. Greetings. Could you all? Yeah. Are you gonna stand there? I'm gonna. Okay. This is all yeah, yeah. Sweat and my makeup all over it. Oh no! I totally feel it. Awesome. Can you go ahead and tell us your name, where you're coming from, and what this day means for you? Sure. Um, so I'm Julia Bernal. I'm from Sandia Pueblo and um, Yuchi. I'm here with Pueblo Action Alliance and uh, you know we're just really excited to see our Auntie Deb and hopefully get our message across to some of our representatives about the federal fossil fuel leasing program and the cleanup and remediation that really needs to happen in the southwest. Absolutely. Can you tell us a little bit more about that remediation that needs to happen? Sure, sure. So our organization really advocates for the protection of the greater Chaco region, which is the uh, northwestern corner of our state in New Mexico. And um, it's been heavily leased out by oil and gas to the federal fossil fuel leasing program. 91% um, of the public lands in that region have already been leased out for oil and gas activity and industry and infrastructure. And so, um, we're here to address um, not just the new infrastructure development, but the legacy of extractive industries in our region because it's not just oil and gas, it's uranium mining, it's coal mining and coal fire plants. And so as an organization, as indigenous peoples from that region, it's really all of our responsibility to advocate for stricter protections. Absolutely. Thank you so much. This is the perfect opportunity to do that. Speak to this administration, get those demands across to them and see some real change. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I need like I need to 
So Fawn Sharp is over there, and I would, I would, I'm looking, I would, so she does a lot of f work. Like she does international f work. But I would, I would want to talk to her about her tribal work and not her NCAA work. So I don't know if you all are interested in that. Let me know. Whatever you want to do. Do you want it? Yeah, I'm, I'm down to just interview anybody. I mean, like, just, you know, just, hello. Oh, yeah. I'll show the Capitol again. Oh, oh Washington, D.C. Taking leads. Anyone, everyone. <laughs> I should have had a little poop poop. I need to blot my upper. Like, I figured out this. I was holding it for a second while you were talking. Welcome to Washington, D.C. Red Road, D.C. We are going to continue to gather interviews. Thanks, everybody, who's joining us, who's watching us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Don't forget to hit like, follow, share, subscribe, get alerted. Thanks for being here. We're going to be live for quite a while, I think, so I hope you're comfortable where you're at. It is hot. It is steamy here in Washington, D.C., but a lot of people are coming. Let us go check out the totem. I've lost our host. I'll assume it there. Looks like they're really? smudging off the totem right now. like that. That's okay. We'll pivot. Pivot. Okay. so sweet to get her in the I should move this way. Okay. I'm going to sent away? Yes. Can I hold it? I got you. Again, thanks everybody who's joining us. We're here at Washington, D.C. at the Red Road to D.C. event. Uh, if you have been with us, you've seen uh, the few of the stops. Uh, we were definitely live at the Hisapa stop in the Black Hills, uh, collecting prayers um, and just like inviting guests, treating people well. Uh, it was a really great event. And now, well, I think maybe a week later, we're here in Washington, D.C. And we're waiting for this event to start. We're trying to get a few interviews uh, beforehand, so uh, hopefully you're able to hear those interviews from different people from different territories who are also here. And we're just gonna keep this live and rolling. It'll be kind of a long day, I think, but it is really hot here, but it feels really good. It feels a little like it's cooling down a little bit, and it feels great. And yeah, you can feel all the, the people, all the energy, people smiling, talking, chatting. And yeah, I was really thankful to be here. So thanks again for, for joining us on this live feed. And again, if you do have the time to share it out, please do. Again, that's how we are able to spread this information with your help. So thanks a lot for that help. And again, this thanks for being here.
And this is on the National Mall. You want to go touch the totem pole? Yes. Let's go touch it. Let's go touch the totem pole. We're asked to, so let's... let's We're gonna ask everyone to kind of stand touch it still? Yeah, we're gonna get ready to start. So Good afternoon everyone. We're going to start promptly in 10 minutes, so if everyone can find your places, take your seats, maybe silence your phone. Thank you everyone for coming to the Red Road to D.C. Final stop. This is kind of the thing where I can just take the mic and raise me watching the event, so I'll, I don't know. I'll just find a place to film it. Okay, everyone, let's say we're going to set up for... The beginning of the event, I'm going to try to see where I can be. Again, this is the Red Road to D.C. in Washington, D.C. Uh, we were just told the event was about to start, so we're just getting ready to position ourselves to show you the event, bring it to you live. Again, thanks for joining us here on the Indian Collective's social media platform. <laughs> Walk into the crowd. Uh, I can try to talk to uh, okay. 
Okay, if you're just joining, we're just waiting for the event to start here. We are in Washington, D.C. We are live right now at the Red Road of D.C. Um, the totem pole is right over there. We can zoom right in. And it's about to be delivered in ceremony to uh, Secretary Deb Holland. Um, sometime during this event that's supposed to happen, I think we'll be witnessing it with you if you are here with us. And we're going to keep this feed live right now. A lot of people moving around. Five minutes until the event will be starting, we were just told. <laughs> and I'm not sure where we're going to be streaming from, so we'll be here. Hello. Hello, hey. how are you doing? Good, how are you? All right, do you want to talk about being here at all? I do. Go ahead, yes. Yeah. Actually, she's My name is Lana Jack, and I'm from Salalo, Oregon. I have come to D.C. because our people have been under extermination to date. And so, you know, when you we think leave. about... I'm going to ask you This is live right now. This is live. Yeah. I'm just going to ask you if you could please Go drink you. another beer. You smell. Oh, you smell. I don't know what's going on. You're on live TV. Go drink some more beer. I asked Go drink some more whiskey. Please. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know exactly what's going on. I apologize. Sorry. That's okay. Excuse yourself, please. Please. And this is live. And that's how it happens, I guess. Yeah. Thank so. you. Thank you. Excuse yourself. Your first and last. Alright. Oh. I guess we're gonna. Uh, I don't know. You might have this question? Thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. What's up? This is how it is. I mean, it's live. Good afternoon. Happen. Oh, there we go. Again, this is a lot of live feed. Uh, things are just going to happen as they happen. My Thanks for joining us. Read it. I'm a citizen of the Caddo Nation of Oklahoma and the director of the Native Organizers Alliance. And I welcome each and every one of you. I would love to give you all a big, sweaty hug and handshake. Not happening. We want to stop this program as we always do in a good way, in a traditional way, when we bring so many of our people and our relatives together. I would like to call the, the, the drum group forward for the blessing. Many of you have tra traveled many many miles to get here. Some have traveled with the House of Tears Lummi Carvers from the Lummi Nation. And so we are so glad that we're able to gather here on the National Mall for this historic ceremony.
Good afternoon. My name is Chief Jesse James Swan. I'm from the Piscataway Kanori tribe. Today, you are on Piscataway land. We acknowledge this by our ancestors being here before us, and we continue to live here now. At this time, I, I'm going to make it quick. I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Julie Yates, and then it'll be a, a drum by Mr. Zote. Thank you. Hello, welcome to our beautiful nation's capital and the homeland of the Piscataway Indian Nation, the Piscataway Kanoi tribe and affiliated tribes, of uh, the Potomac River, which is right behind you, the Anacostia River and our Chesapeake Bay. Our people have been here and uh, for many, many, many moons. And um, as you see behind you, that's the Capitol. That once was a site where we held many meetings. The ground behind you, which is the monument, that both the monument and the Capitol uh, were made from sandstone that were carried by our indigenous people. Uh, I welcome all of you from all over the four directions. Uh, the totem pole, the alliance, uh, everyone that came. I'm trying to make this short and quick, uh, but welcome and um, uh, God bless every one of you. And, and uh, if you have any questions after uh, the event, um, I can explain more about our history or you can find more about it in the National Museum of the Native American where my father's photos are displayed on the second floor. Good afternoon. In addition to the Piscataway people whose lands we are on, there are also many, many Native people transplanted to the Washington, D.C. area. In fact, there are 127 area agencies and organizations that deal in American Indian issues as well as have Native employees. And so, as um, one of these people, I've, we've been asked to sing an honor song, which is a protocol among Native people. Percussion transcends cultural and tribal boundaries. As this totem pole began its journey from the House of Tears in the Lummi tribe, up right close to Seattle, Washington, and the Canadian border, drums were sounded. Drums across America, it made many stops, and you could hear these drums. In the honor of this totem pole, my father's going to sing a song, an honor song. The words in this song says, I am happy that I'm still able to hear the drums. They make my heart feel good. And this is an honor song for this totem pole coming to the Washington, D.C. area. Can I please have everybody stand? by Mr. Ralph Zotai, a full-blooded Kiowa Indian. In our language, we say, Aim Hebe, welcome.
Hitman said to us, Maheo Nanako Natsusave, Lance Fisher, Lance Fisher Nahishave. Good afternoon, my name is Lance Fisher. I am from the Northern Chinese tribe. This is Shivani uh, Rosky. Uh, hello, I'm Tamita Kempi. I'm from the Northern Chinese tribe. I am from the Oglala Sutra as well as the Northern Peruvian Nation. And, um, We're going to perform the Big Mountain Song as composed by Howard Badhand. And that translation is President, look at me, this is I standing here. Uh, I defend Grandmother Earth and I live seeking peace. We always start in a good way by acknowledging not only the history but the presence of our tribal nations. We continue to be at the heart of our communities. So we are so glad that they were able to join us. I just want to say that we are welcoming you on behalf of the Native Organizers Alliance, Cecila, Illuminatives, the Natural History Museum, and many other partner organizations who helped to make it possible to bring this totem across the country to visit sacred sites virtually and physically. I want to recognize, uh, as uh, over to the my right, your left, um, the carvers, the House of Tears carvers, who will you will hear in a little bit but what the power of this totem pole is, is that it's brought together people from Snake River, from Chaco Canyon, from Line 5, up in northern Minnesota, all the tribes in northern Minnesota, the Bristol, Bristol Bay Indian community, the Sault Ste. Marie tribes who are working to stop the Line 5 pipeline from desiccating their sacred waters the Arctic, Bristol Bay, it has brought so many nations together. Too, there are too many sacred places to name. All of those sacred places deserve to be protected. We are all speaking in one voice for sacred places, protecting sacred places now. Our sacred places 
are part of are part of the beautiful lands and waterways and oceans that we live with and among. All who farm, who fish, who hunt and hike must join tribal nations and native communities to prevent the destruction of Mother Earth. We are building a politically empowered movement that will show not only are we ready with solutions, but we will also show that we are strong because of our traditional cultures and our traditional ways of caring for Mother Earth. Today you will hear from tribal elected officials, traditional leaders, and grassroots community organizers. Those are the three, three elements of being able to build a politically empowered movement that can protect not only sacred places, but also achieve tribal sovereignty. There are many people who've, come, who've gathered here to honor the House of Tears carvers from the Lummi Nation, to honor the prayers and hopes that this totem pole has brought to DC, and to speak with the Biden administration and Congress. But most of all, we are here because it is the time to end, to end climate crisis, to end the, the policies that have been dictated by the extractive fossil fuel industries. There are many people who are in the audience that I wish I could recognize all because, but I would like to, to welcome former uh, Secretary of the Interior, Sally Jewell, who's here in the audience. Um, we also have con Congressman from Hawaii, Representative Kahili. Thank you for coming. Thank you with, for standing with us. And now I'd like to introduce Doug James, House of Tears, Lummi Carver. So, I'm sorry, we have to change things a little bit. I'm sorry, Doug. Now we will hear from Chairwoman I shouldn't be using high tech. Chairwoman Brenda Mallory, who is the ch uh, chairwoman of the council. Oh my God, I'm so sorry, my iPad just shut off. How, 21st century Indian problems, the iPad. The chair of the Council on Environmental Quality. talking before this about whether it was the Council on Environmental Quality or the Qu Council on Equality and so anyway um, it's such a pleasure to be here uh, today and to be invited to join in uh, on this event uh, I just want to thank everyone uh, here both for your journey that you've made and the years of advocacy uh, and for leading the way on issues that are so important to this nation and to uh, this planet. Um, I'm grateful for the work that, that you all do and have done. It's an honor to be in your presence as we gather on the ancestral homelands of the Anacosta and Piscataway people. One of my favorite quotes that I bring up in many speeches that I give is one that is purported to be uh, a Native American proverb that's, that reads, we do not inherit the earth. We do not inherit the lands from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. Uh, in my mind, your journey across the country and the message it delivers about recognizing sacred value of places and preserving them for all people for future generations captures the meaning of that that's behind that uh, proverb and is so inspiring to me. It's also connected to the work that we're trying to do in this administration. There is a deep commitment to achieve our common goal of protecting lands, water, and air for generations to come while ensuring equitable policy choices. I'll say that again. 
while ensuring equitable policy choices. As we know uh, that any initiative will only be successful if we actively engage local, state, and tribal governments, indigenous communities, and a range of other stakeholders. I know that you have long been at the forefront of this work and that our future together must be one of partnership. Correcting historic wrongs will require a long-term commitment, but acknowledging a need for change and creating a plan of action is a critical first step. It's a step that we are trying to make at this moment. That is why President Biden created the first ever White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, which is made up of 26 longtime environmental justice advocates and experts from all across the country. The council has devoted countless hours developing recommendations to support the federal government's efforts to address current and historic environmental injustices, including issues that are related to tribal and indigenous communities. My team at CEQ is working with every single agency on an initiative called Justice 40, which is a whole of government effort to deliver 40% of the overall benefits from federal investments in climate and clean energy to disadvantaged communities. We have a lot of work ahead of us, but together we can get it done. Thank you for the work that you're doing every day, and thank you for inviting me to join you this afternoon. I am so sorry that I'm unable to stay for further um, parts of the program, but I can tell already that there is great energy here, and I'm grateful to have been here for a moment. So thank you very much. Now I'd like to bring to the stage the House of Tears Carvers. Doug James, a carver who's been working for over 20 years on totem poles such as this. He will be speaking on behalf of the master carver, Jewel James, who we hold in our prayers because he could not be with us today because of health issues. I have been working with, with Doug and the House of Tears over these last several months, and it's been an honor and an inspiration to be a part of this journey. Have Melanie and Duran come up too. Melanie and Duran, would you please come up? First of all, I'd like to give the credit and glory back to our creator. The poll itself speaks for itself because it's been reaching out and touching many hearts since uh, April. We've been on the road all the way down the west coast and uh, we crossed over clean to Miami and then went back home and then turned around and came back through again. But it's in recognition to touch down and touch the hearts and souls and spirits. This is uh, our house of tear carvers. This is our youngest carver right here, Caden. You know, and he's uh, he's been learning as we go. So he's been doing a great job. He says, I painted the bottom. So, and his mother, Heather, here, see. Um, my wife, Siamowit. So, Caleb. Teresa, Teresa Sheldon. Melanie is one that uh, does uh, all the painting over here for the last, uh, yeah, the murals. You know, if you got anything you want to add to it, go ahead. But anyway, just want to roll along here, and I want to put my hands up to the lions that are here, to each and every one of you that's taken a breath of time out of your lives to be here today. For those that are stepping up and offering their, your, your prayerful songs, our hands are out to you and saying, Heishka. Thanking you for honoring this day, because this day is not ours. It belongs to all of us. Each and every one of you that had a tugging on your heart to be here today, this day belongs to you. 
And I want to thank uh, our secretary, Deb Holland. My hands are out to her for all she's been doing. You know, and the list can go on and on, but we don't want to tarry here too long. But, you know, I just want to say hi, Scott, from the Lummi Nation. You know, this is our 20th year that we brought poles across this country. We brought them clean as far away as uh, 100 miles north of Winnipeg. Every one of these are gifts. We never charged anybody for them, any of them. We raised all our own funding to get them to where they needed to go just to lift up the people that are crying out for help. And our world, our countries are crying out for help, you know, because of the climate change, because of the salmon are dying, the orcas are, are losing all their food, you know, for those that don't have voices, that's who we're reaching out to. And we're just asking each and every one of you to come together with one heart and one mind. I'd swallow him. I'd swallow him means to be of one heart and one mind. So with that, you know, I just want to say Heishka and Estella Jesse um, to all my relations. Osiem. Heishka. Does Kaden want to sing? Thank you so much, Doug and House of Tears, for giving us this opportunity to speak in one voice, one heart, one mind. Our next speaker is, is Pawi Rivera. He is the... I'm going to let him introduce himself because my iPad is stopped again. Mbiakanti, na kwanzire Pawi Rivera kino kawe, putuaga winge yuweri omu, tenge tei. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pawi Rivera. I'm from the pueblo of Puake in New Mexico. The New Mexicans in the house. <laughs> I serve as our uh, senior advisor and tribal affairs director in our White House Intergovernmental Affairs Office. So thank you so much. I, I'm honored to stand on the mall today with uh, tribal and community leaders from across Indian country. The White House Council on Environmental Quality Director, Brenda Mallory, who you heard from uh, minutes ago, and obviously uh, Secretary Holland, who's uh, speaking shortly here. So thank you so much for having us. And, and thank you to the Red Road to DC organizers, uh, Native American Organizers Alliance, Zetsi Led, the National History Museum, and Illuminative. And I, I want to honor and uh, thank the House of Tears Lummi Carvers for their vision and this beautiful totem pole that's before us here today. Uh, and and the, the many blessings and prayers and the messages from across Indian country about the importance of sacred places, lands, and waters. And thank you to Master Carver Jewel James. Uh, we send our best wishes to him for a speedy recovery and good health. And I want to thank uh, his brother Doug James and his wife, uh, Sialmawet, for their beautiful, beautiful work and for making this journey to bring their magnis not magnificent totem pole across the country. Uh, President Biden remains strongly committed to strengthening the nation-to-nation -nation relationship and advancing tribal sovereignty. In March, President Biden signed the American Rescue Plan that delivered $31.2 billion to tribal communities, the largest single payment ever to Indian country. Those critical investments have supported COVID response in tribal communities, the largest child tax credit for families, native language revitalization, direct finan financial support, and much more. And the new bipartisan infrastructure bill introduced in Congress yesterday will invest critically needed resources in Indian country for roads, bridges, and make the largest investment in clean drinking water and wastewater infrastructure in American history. President Biden is committed, as you are, to achieving ambitious environmental justice goals. Just last week, the Biden-Harris administration issued Justice 40, a whole-of-government effort to ensure that federal agencies work with tribes, states, local communities to deliver at least 40 percent 
of the overall benefits from the federal investments in climate and clean energy to historically underrepresented communities, including tribal nations. And the America the Beautiful initiative outlines a core set of principles that will restore 30% of our lands and waters by 2030. <laughs> Tribal nations will be key partners in these conservation efforts that will create jobs and support healthy communities. America's lands, waters, and resources are precious, and as America's first people, indigenous communities know this best. Ensuring that they're here for generations to come is one of our most important duties. So on behalf of the White House, we thank the Lummi Carvers, the Red Road to DC organizers, and all the supporters for bringing this beautiful, incredible totem pole and powerful message about the importance of protecting sacred sites to our nation's capital. Kunta Woha. We hope that all of you, all of you, before you leave the mall, will spend a few minutes and pray with the totem. Add your, your prayers and your hopes and your dreams that have been collected in this, with the travels of this totem pole. You know, on election night, 2018, our hearts were so full when we heard the news that Congresswoman Sharice Davids and Congresswoman Deb Hollins were elected to Congress after hundreds of years, the first two Indian women to be elected to Congress. Her life's work, the way that she walks, is inspiring Indian young women across the country to say, we need to be there. We need to be a part of mapping out what the future will be for our descendants. And as we watched then Congresswoman Deb Hollins before the Senate committee during the hearing, it was a class, a whole school on how and why indigenous perspectives must be a part of governance. We must say Thank you, we love you, and we are so glad that Madam Secretary is here with us to welcome this totem pole. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hello. I am so happy to be here and to see all of you and welcome to Washington, D.C. For those of you who don't live here, necessarily. And I, I just saw that my good friend, Congressman Kai Kahele, is here with the Hawaiian uh, members of the Hawaiian Native community. And I'm so happy to see you, dear friend. Thank you for being here. It's very nice. So, Judith, thank you for that kind introduction. I'm so happy, and thank you for your years of advocacy and hard work to bring attention to indigenous communities in the most meaningful ways. Gwadzi haupa. Greetings, everyone. It means so much to be here with all of you and to recognize the incredible journey you all have taken. I'm honored to be joined by the Chair of the Council on Environmental Quality, Brenda Mallory, and I thank Brenda for acknowledging that we are on indigenous land. I want to acknowledge the organizers of this event, House of Tears Carvers, the Natural History Museum, Native Organizers Alliance, Illuminative, CC Lay for everything you do and have done and will continue to do. All of your hard work has led to this moment, to this spot. The fact that we are all here is not insignificant. When our nation's capital was established, its policies were intended to exclude us, to assimilate us, 
Laws and policies were written without considering indigenous communities' challenges or their strengths. And we are working hard to undo so many consequences of these actions. Today and every day, we break barriers to those institutions and systems that were designed to keep us out. Our paths are crossing in this moment because we're coming together in a new era. An era of truth, of healing, of growth. An era in which our indigenous knowledge is valued and respected, in which indigenous leadership has a seat at the table to make decisions about our communities. In which we have an opportunity to rise above the challenges our people face and build a brighter future for all of us. It's a new era in which our country recognizes the dark pages of our history and listens and learns from that history so that we can all be a part of meaningful tribal engagement to bend the arc of the moral universe toward justice. Your journey, like the wind, the birds, the water, carry the prayers of everyone who has laid hands on this totem pole. It is a heavy load to carry because we know that all of our actions inform our future. And I have hope for the future. I have hope because it's ingrained in who we are as people. It's the same hope that my Pueblo ancestors had when they survived famine and drought, when they settled along the Rio Grande, cultivated crops and preserved our culture and traditions through the hardest of times. The attempts to take away our traditions, our languages, and our cultures failed because we are still here. It's the same hope that brings all of us together for our people, for our communities, for our earth. Every time I visit a protected sacred site, it gives me hope knowing that all of us are working to honor and respect these important places. All of you give me hope. As we move forward in this new era, we do so with the support and the respect of President Biden and Vice President Harris. And their commitment to live up to the federal government's trust and treaty responsibilities. We do so knowing that when we work together, we can realize our collective vision to ensure a brighter future for our children and our children's children. All of the speakers on this stage, the artists who use their generations of traditional craftsmanship to carve this beautiful totem pole, and the folks who use their time and energy to make today possible, are fierce. I'm honored to serve as your Secretary of the Interior and to be with you at the culmination of this journey and know that this is a beautiful step in our much longer march toward justice. My prayers and thoughts are with you as we continue our work together, as we raise awareness, as we seek a brighter future for all of us, Thank you all so much for being here, and I am so happy to see every single one of you. Thank you. Our Secretary of the Interior. We're creating the space for her to do what's right. Our organizing, our prayers. And now I want to call on the National Congress of the American Indians President, Bon Shaft.
Vaughn has been leading the way in helping people understand why informed consent must be the way forward. Now, yo, Hutch, I'm Chuck, I wish to ask Chief On behalf of the National Congress of American Indians, representing more than 574 sovereign tribal nations all across the country, we thank you for the will be respected 
and we have a duty all across this country and globally for all indigenous peoples because there are indigenous peoples in this moment who are risking life and death to speak out for the Amazon, life and death to speak out, to protect that which is sacred. And it is up to us to hold the most powerful country on the planet accountable to protect our sacred sites. And as we do that here in the United States, we will uphold this country, lead this country to protect sacred sites all over the world. That is our duty, that is our charge, that is our calling. On behalf of the National Congress of American Indians, we stand firm in that mission. We honorably accept that mission that is represented by this totem, and we will support and honor our sacred sites. Siokwil Chihatsi. Thank you, Fawn. Now, we are going to have speed dating. You are going to hear from every single community group, native community group and tribal leader who have come and have been a part of this journey, but not to worry. Two minutes each, they're gonna get to the point if the creator has a plan. The first of the speed dating will start with Daniel So, a, the Navajo tribal councilman from Councilor Chapter. Come on, give him a round of applause. Well, oh, yes, hey, Chicago said it now. Send the kin and slow. None is as a touchy. Was a she, was listening as a che, no hopani, that's another. With that, I greet. Acknowledge Mother Earth, Father Sky, the, the constellations that form the universe. We are in between those powers. And yes, our lands are being attacked, desecrated. Sacred sites are in danger. But guess what? Seven grandmas basically empowered us to say, do something, stand up, say something. And that's what we're doing today. We are standing to stop oil and gas extraction. We are the anti-frackers. And we're using the aspect of the connectedness, the land, the air, the water, the sacred. We have our own L-A-W-S. We have our own laws that govern how we maintain the stewardship of these sacred elements. And thank you, everyone. Wow. We did a water ceremony at Councilor Chapter. That's where the tsunami of fracking is occurring. And we have to focus. Yes, health impact assessment, but our relative says, no, let's look at it through Navajo lens. We are connected to the land, the air, the water, and the sacred. What do you feel about it? And the community says, that's, that's our issues. And they're the ones that empower us to be here. We had a water ceremony and folks were blessed. Guess what? The rains came. The rivers will flow. The grass will grow. The treaties have to be enforced, adhered to, and abided by. That's what 
we ultimately are looking at. Yes, 574 tribal nations. Each of us have a perspective on how tribal consultation shall move forward. Not consultation, that's a piece of paper that says, what do you think about it, do you approve? No, collaboration. We want collaboration, not a path to consent. And that's the part that we have to understand. We have our own views. We have our own LAWS. And, and understand, yes, the Greater Chaco landscape extends far beyond the lines on a map, far beyond the state boundaries. And, and our forefathers, our Saza, our ancestors, they already knew it. Those sacred places, sacred spaces have power, energy, and they have the aspect to touch us on the shoulder, to wake us up from our sleep, stand up, speak for the people. And so today we're, we're speaking for the people, the water, the air, and the sacred spaces. And the young, the unborn, and the elderly. For us in the middle, those of us, our job is to protect these segments of our population. Thank you for allowing me to uh, basically um, impart some thoughts and to Madam Secretary, we appreciate her work. We appreciate what the Biden administration is doing. We have a voice and we have to be vocal. Our group imparts legislation, our group imparts regulatory changes and that's what's unique about the Greater Chaco Coalition. In other words, frack off Chaco. Thank you. Aneen. Nui Nui Ikwa Indiznakaz. My name is Second Water Woman. My English name is Great Grandmother Mary Lyons. I reside from the invisible line from Canada and Minnesota. We have been on a healing journey throughout Turtle Island. We originated from the center of a land called Minnesota. We are transplants from the east prior to the colonization and reside on Dakota territories in the northern part of the state. We are Anishinaabe's First Nation Ojibwe and we come from Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. We have made the journey heading west to California to the reservations in the border, western borders of their state, Lone Pine and Bishop Reservations to take part in ceremonies with the Diné prayer runners that ran 215 miles for the Canadian children that were recently discovered and the eight that were returned home to the Dakotas and the many other children for the government boarding schools that patiently await to be found and to be returned to their grandparents' homelands. We traveled to the south through Navajo and Hopi lands and upward through the center of Turtle Island in prayer for the lands, people, air, and water. We rested back in Minnesota and got ready to come east to be with the totem and all that resides within her because we see her as a feminine. There is something I would like to read to you from my fellow water protectors across Turtle Island. This particularly comes because it stands in our territory, line three. We are grateful to you for your work and your commitment to Indian people and Mother Earth. 
We also acknowledge the complexity of your position. This I'm speaking to Deb Holland. We're asking you to suspend the construction of Line 3 until a full assessment of endangered species, cultural resources, and water can be undertaken. This pipeline violates the trust responsibility that the United States has to American Indian people, causing widespread destruction of treaty, treaty resources like wild rice and poisoning of waters full of fish and life. This project had an inadequate review of endangered or threatened species, and there was not an adequate cultural resource review for this project. This June, Enbridge received the largest water allocation in the history of Minnesota. We're from the land of 10,000 lakes. Can you, can you imagine? The Minnesota Department of Natural Resources approved a permit to Enbridge for 630 million gallons and allowed the company to amend that to 5 billion gallons, a tenfold increase over what was reviewed in the environmental impact statement. This 5 billion gallons of water allocation occurred without an environmental review and in a time of the deepest drought in our recent history. The tribes were denied information and asked to review the project two weeks before the permit was issued. Not only are tribal nations concerned, but 32, 32 of our state legislators in Minnesota wrote a July 27th letter to the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency asking the agency temporarily suspend the Section 401 certification and order Enbridge, order Enbridge to immediately halt all drilling along the Line 3 route until the state is no longer experiencing drought conditions until a thorough investigation can be completed by your agency into the fracking accidents. This Canadian corporation is destroying the Great Lakes in our world. In time that we are trying to address climate change, this corporation will bring three times more oil than it did before to our land, tripling carbon emissions. We're asking you, we're asking you here in this land, this capital, the White House, Biden administration, come on guys, this is for the people. Yeah. This ain't just an Indian thing, this is for all people. This planet here, this planet here is made up of water, but most of the water that we have here is very limited for us human beings to survive. We want you to wake up because this is in the heart of our land. <clears throat> So we're asking you to suspend the construction of Line 3 and to protect our future generations. Now, myself and you see my family, we're the top hat long skirt society, we're Madewans. We're in this third leg here to be with the totem and the carvers and all our relatives and all our relative allies. So we'll, we're gonna return paying our respect to deliver that last bundle to the Carlisle boarding school and to put our prayers down. So I want to say miigwech to these carvers for the east that they came from. I never thought I'd see this day. You see, I'm from that boarding school here. I have a brother that never came home. I had a sister that was murdered. So everything those prayers within this totem and Deb Holland, our people, and for all the people that put this together, our cloak has fallen and the Red Nations has risen up. Let the prophecies unfold. Be quick. Good afternoon, my friends and relatives. My name is Nola Taken Alive, and I serve on the tribal council from the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. And I know we have only two minutes, and we have several elders standing behind me who want to share a message as well. But I want to thank Deb Holland, our relative. And I want to remind her to continue to be fierce, continue to, to stand up, not only for indigenous people, but for all of us around the world. Because in two, 
2016, young people started a ripple effect, sparked and woke up the world to the injustices that are happening, not only amongst our indigenous people, but the injustices that are happening to our relatives, the water, the earth, Mother Earth. And I want us to continue to remember that spark and remember that ripple effect that all of us have. And right now, we still have the DAPL pipeline that is running through, illegally running oil through our relative, the water, Mini Wichoni. And I wanna thank all of you, every single one of you who are standing up, who are standing up for all of the injustices because in our Lakota way, we say which means all of our relatives. That doesn't matter the color of where you, who you are, where you come from, but it's, it's about being in unison, unifying. And this is what this totem pole, when it came to Standing Rock last week, it was a reminder to all of us to unify so that we will have a beautiful life for generations to come. So with that, I want to say Lila Wopila Tonka on behalf of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe and on behalf of the future generations and the young people. Mini Wichoni, water is life, and it will still and always be Mini Wichoni. Lila Wopila Tonka, ha hechetu, me dakio awase. Good afternoon. My name is Brian Mason. I'm the vice chairman for the Shoshone Paiute tribes of the Duck Valley Indian Reservation. We were blessed by the Lummies that came by the, uh, during our 4th of July celebration and they spent a couple days in the valley and we appreciate it. Thank you. So I represent one of the 27 tribes in the state of Nevada. The Northern Paiute, the Western Shoshone, the Southern Bayou, and the Washu tribes. Where the mining industry has bullied with the assistance of the federal agencies to extract ore on an unprecedented manner. If Nevada was its own country, it'd be the fourth largest producing country in the world. And we watch it every day. Right now, there's a, uh, as we are speaking, it is in federal court right now on trying to get a stay with Thacker Pass with the, uh, the um, Northern Paiute tribe from Fort McDermott. The Western Shoshone have been fighting for the sacred site of Mount Tanabo since 2002, and that was not halted. Tribes have been the most persecuted peoples in these United States. All the social injustices that we have suffered, yet still we are here and yet still we survive. We are the true protectors of the land, the water, all life, plants, pine nuts, sweet grass, dosa harvest areas. In Nevada, the land is referred to as Nua Sogobia, our land. In, in 1863, the tribe signed the Treaty of Ruby Valley in 1863. It was promptly broken in 1864 and has never been enforced since. So earlier this year, I testified in the Nevada State Legislation at the last day of legislative body trying to address the Nevada mining tax and was not successful. They all agreed with what I said, but they said I was too late. And so we have to try again. We've been trying ever since 1960s to curtail mining. So we're going to ask 
Congress, Senators, the Secretary to assist us with consultation and consent is a major, major issue. Consultation does not happen in Nevada. They send you a letter, they certify it, and if you don't reply back, they count that as consultation. The Ninth District Court has already determined that that is not consultation, but yet they keep binding. So we are gonna ask for assistance for everybody on the assisting of this mining, the mining that's been going on forever. So after we were given citizenship on our own land, Native Americans have fought for this country in all instances, in World War II, Vietnam, Somalia, the War on Terror, so the people that sit in that office behind me, I say to them, we fought for you. Now you fight for us. Yes. Thank you. Ani, everyone. Kiwede Nagabo Kwe Indishnikaz, Ganushnikani Nindonjaba. My name is the woman who stands in the north, and I stand before you today to represent the waters of the Great Lakes, the original territory of our Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi. When we look at the Great Lakes and we think of water, as many of my relatives have spoken before me on DAPL, on Line 5, our people understand that water is sacred because in the line of creation, the, cre the Creator created man last, not because we are the most important, but because we are the least important. We rely on the land, on the water, on our animal relatives in order to survive. Bay Mills Indian community and several other tribal nations in the state of Michigan are currently fighting Enbridge Line 5 that runs through the Great Lakes, that runs through our ceded territory. Those black snakes, that are harming our lands, our waters, our ecosystems. Enbridge Line 5 is a dual pipeline that carries crude oil and natural gas through 13 million acres of water and 14 million acres of land. Land that my tribal nation ceded to the United States in a sacred promise. It was an exchange to create the state of Michigan. And in exchange, our people were promised the right to fish, hunt, and gather in that ceded territory. And my ancestors knew that that was a sacred promise because with those rights, we would be able to continue to thrive as a people. We would be able to live out our traditional life ways. We would be able to maintain our culture, our sacred places, our sacred grounds, understanding that water is sacred. Just as we rely on water for our livelihoods, we also understand in our teachings that as women, as water protectors, as water carriers, that we rely on water to give birth to those next seven generations. Enbridge Line 5 has spilled more than 1.1 million gallons of oil and natural gas in the state of Michigan since it was implemented. And although we have very thankfully not seen an oil spill in the Straits of Mackinac, it's only a matter of time before it ruptures, it leaks, and it causes irreversible harm in the Great Lakes, in our heart of Turtle Island. How can we look at our children in those next seven generations and say we allowed this to happen, that we destroyed the largest freshwater body resource in the United States, that we destroyed that heart of Turtle Island for profit? We have a teaching that says the decisions you make today should take into consideration those next seven generations. And that teaching reminds us that what we do today has impacts long after we are gone. Do we want to teach our children that we care more about profits than we do about leaving them a sustainable world? Do we want to teach our children that this is how we respect the land, that this is how we respect the water? We should be teaching our children that things like Line 5, like the Black Snake, 
like the harm to our sacred places are not okay. And it's incumbent upon this administration, the United States of America, our state and federal representatives to also honor those treaties. When we think of treaties, like the 1836 Treaty of Washington that my tribe signed, many people see them as a thing of the past, but they are living exchanges. It's not just a treaty for my tribe, it's a treaty for the United States. You receive something in exchange. The state of Michigan still exists. And because of that, you need to protect our treaty rights, our treaty resources in the Great Lakes. So with that, I ask all of you to say with me, water is a treaty right. Water is a treaty right. Miigwech. Lolma, go quiet. My name is Clark Tanakungva. I am the vice chairman for the Hopi Nation uh, from the state of Arizona. It is wonderful to be here today amongst all my brothers and sisters that have gathered here on our sacred lands. We cannot say these were once sacred lands. They are still sacred. As I say, each and every one of us has stepped foot here at one time or another. We have a place on this land. I am currently as the vice chair, co-chair with the Beersier Coalition, which was formed as a commission by the President Barack Obama back in 2016. We represent what is called Bears Ears in Southern Utah to protect it as a national monument. Behind me stand some of the great leaders from some of the nations that we represent. From the Ute Nation, we have Chairman Hart. From the Navajo Nation, we have Hank Stevens, representing the Navajo Nation. We are a coalition of five tribes that are fighting currently to restore the proclamation that President Barack Obama instilled in back in 2016. Another one of the broken treaties that America seems to continue to walk upon us native people here in the United States of America. It was short-lived by the man named called Donald R. Trump. Donald R. Trump went and undid the proclamation of 1.3 million acres to less than 85% of what the president had proclaimed as a national monument. So today, we stand here before you, President Biden, Vice President Harris. You were part of that administration back in 2016. We ask you to do what is right. Do your homework. Make sure that it's proclaimed back as a national monument. We all have ancestral ties to that place. They're called Bears Ears today. We have ties to the Greater Chaco region. Let's keep it the way it should be. They are sacred lands, people. Lands are not for sale. If my shrine as a kiva that stands there in southern Utah represents that big white house behind me, symbolizes something that is important to America, well, I hope they respect the same way as I do the kivas and some of the dwellings that are still left there in southern Utah. Let's not forget, ladies and gentlemen, is that we are in a severe drought in the southwest. I don't know what it's going to take for people to learn water is life. Without water, you are nothing. You are only a piece of material. You cannot survive anywhere in this world. Water is not for sale. Order oil is not for sale. Land is not for sale. Unless it goes through us, the tribal nations, with proper authorizations and so forth. So I thank you all for giving us this time, for speaking on behalf of Bears Ears. I hope you help stand with us to go forth with it as far as what we are here today. We had the totem pole there two weeks ago, gave it our blessings, gave it our hopes, to give our message here today
that we are united as one, as the young one totem pole there, tells our story of the American history, tells uh, about the Secretary Holland as who she is represented on that totem pole. So we love you all. We thank you all. May we live in peace. May we live in harmony. May we live in humility that we shall progress from this point on and be recognized just like any other race or culture that's occupying our land today. Native American lives matter also too today. It's not only black lives matter. It's not only the Asian lives matter. We are the true first Americans. And I thank you here for giving us the, the two minutes to speak. Please protect Bears Ears. Kwakwai. My name is Faith Spotted Eagle, Standing Stone from the Oyate of the Dakota Nation and the Ocheti Shakoi on the Missouri River. I came here after a 13 year fight against the KXL pipeline. If you had, raise your hand if you sent prayers for that victory. Woo! That was an example of an amazing, amazing organizational effort that took 13 years of an unlikely alliance of people like you that came together. We can do these things and they're magic. They, they don't happen overnight. This fight is generational. When I came earlier this morning, I was sitting over there and this little girl from the Cherokee Nation, where are those grandmothers? She came up to me and she's three years old and she's got a cape on her back that says water is sacred. Three years old and she came up to me and she went like this. That's the kind of generational commitment that we have to make. I came here 50 years ago. Uh, secretly, I'm 100 years old. Um, and I spoke and developed testimony for the Indian Self-Determination Act in 1975. That was a game changer 50 years ago. We're here once again, and we heard one of our matrilineal leaders talk about a game changer, but she cannot do it on her own. We have to have those powerful organizing efforts that brought this beautiful relative um, that carries all these prayers. It takes commitment, hard work, it takes resources, and most importantly, it takes prayers. We saw that magic along the Missouri River. The other thing is reform of violent hierarchical structures. Just because these executive orders on social justice have come out in the Biden administration, the people that were there before those executive orders, they're still there. What's going to make them change? They will act quieter, they will act more compliant, but change will not occur unless we hold them accountable. And that comes with free prior and informed consent. Consultation is a dominance word. It means that you've already agreed. And you're only, they're only petting us on the head. We have to have pre-decisional as early as possible. We have to get our people out on the land, do countless surveys to identify those sites, document them, GIS them, protect our bioregions before the industry shows up. We are remiss in that. We need to get with it. We can do that through citizen science, train our young people. They do not have to have doctoral degrees to do that. All we need to do is care, to teach, to teamwork, and remember not to pull each other down. This work is not about jealousy, it's about support and courage. Uh, Co-management. We are the original scientists. We knew about managing water. We knew about managing plants. We continue to do that. We managed fire. At this point, more of us need to come together in a very organized, best method of all to ask for co-management of these areas. Our tribe, the Ihangtua, the Yangtin Sioux, are putting in an effort to manage a lake that was managed by U.S. Fish and Wildlife that has literally destroyed our community because of mismanagement. That is not okay. That is another form of violence. We are asking to co-management through a 638 process. We need more examples, but we don't have to do it. We cannot do it. My, do my uh, sister came up with a makeup Indian world called Skabidi Hu. She, means, she said that means half A. We can't do that kind of work. We have to have the best organizing, the best plans, 
the best coming together to accomplish that and be successful in the management of these sites. Everyone here is a treaty signer. Everyone in Congress is a treaty signer. We have to pass that word and make them accountable that they signed those treaties as a citizen of this nation and it has to be enforced. What has that caused that is to give them plenary power in the court decision called Lone Wolf versus Hitchhike, this beautiful tribe said, stop, you're taking 500,000 acres of my land. They had nowhere to go. They went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled against them and that's where we got plenary power, which means that Congress has absolute undisputed power over me standing here and my grandchildren and that frightens me. For that reason, I will never be quiet. That little three-year-old over there, we need thousands of those little three-year-olds that are gonna do this and do the work for the next 50 years. We need to have those grandparents encouraging and telling them that we need them. Um, my uncle, Vine Deloria, in his The Red Prophet, he said that no legislation should go through that building over there without the explicit participation of our people. Constantly, people will make laws about us, for us, on us, under us, even when we're dead, that have never been asked of us wh whether that helps or hinders us. Most of us hinders it. So we have to go over to that house and be constantly involved and support the tribal relative, um, our matrilineal leader, Holland, because she needs, she's not gonna be able to do all those things that we're asking her of. So that leaves it to us on the ground in the front line. We don't need to always get arrested. You know, we could get in good trouble like that congressman said, but we need you out of jail, we need you on the ground, we need you in the court. We don't wanna go to court either, but we need you at the water. One of my granddaughters, when we did this water ceremony, when our precious relatives came from the Lummi Nation, she went down to the water and she said, came back and she was crying. I said, my girl, what's the matter? She said, Kunshi, which means grandmother. She said, I asked the water for help and the water said, granddaughter, I can't help you anymore. You have to help me. So that's the message you need to take back to all of your, the sacred water and that it is our turn now. The prayers are not gonna, they're gonna make it powerful, but we have to do some work. It has to be in the state houses of where we live, even though those houses are not friendly to us. And lastly, I think that we have to unlearn some behaviors of closed systems, divide and conquer, and oppressive behavior that we have inherited, and it's called colonial abuse. We must not compete with each other in these things because I saw it in KXL. This is not about competition. This is about survival in our grandchildren's grandchildren's grandchildren. I wish I had the time to sing our mini Wichoni song, but it's gonna be in my heart. I'm gonna sing it when I go back to the water, when the Lummies came for their Indian visit. Usually when you come for an Indian visit, you stay three weeks. So next time, three weeks. Thank you for coming. Wo pita. Oha. Mitakiasi. Sing it. Can I sing it? Okay, if I sing it, you got to close your eyes. You got to speak to the water. All of the plants that are being threatened, the endangered species, close your eyes and send that spirit strong to your homelands where those sacred sites are listening. <coughs> Choi 
Niki de we choi chage ye ye ki a ye unizanik de o he Niki de we chose ani ye Niki de we chose ani ye Niki de we chose ani ye ye ki a ye. Unizanik de o he, Niki de we chose anik de o he. Mitakyo asi, may our sacred sites live forever. Oha, wopira. Good afternoon, my name is Davis Filfred. I come from the Navajo Nation. I'm here representing the Navajo Nation on behalf of the Navajo Nation President Honorable Jonathan Nez. I work as one of his staff assistants. I'm also here representing the board members on the Bear Ears Coalition. I do have a, a position statement from the Navajo Nation that's supported by many resolutions and uh, our own legislation. Bear Ears should be restored. The Bear Ears has been in the works for four decades. It's been worked on by the Navajo Nation, the Ute Nation, the Zuni Nation, and the Hopi Nation, and the Uinta Arrays. President Trump attacked our Bear Ears, and we have many litigations from many different tribes. And we want our current president, President Biden, we call him Joba. If you know what Joba means, a person with a kind heart. It just so happened that President Biden's name sounds Joba. We're asking Mr. President or Biden to restore the 1.9 million acres. The importance of the Bear Ears, our ancestors have lived there for generations hunting, gathering herbs, and they prayed. And this was their way of life, their culture, our ancestors. Today, we were there for three nights the other night and we got rained out. It's a beautiful place. I come from a contaminant world, the greater Anath field in the Anath Utah. I am a true Utah and our soil or water and our air is completely contaminated with petroleum, arsenic, uranium, and many others. And we don't want this sacred land. We have many sacred land in the Nen Nation. People know us as, as the four sacred mountain. We have many sacred mountain. Bear Ears is one of them. We call it Shashja. I can give you stories, but those stories are only told when reptiles even bears are hibernating we only tell them during the winter these are cultural sensitivity we have uh the yabiches that's where their stories their songs their prayers it all comes from there so we're asking not only the former secretary of interior but the current secretary of interior to please support and we're just waiting patiently to hear from our president. And I know that I'm echoing what the uh, coalition has been saying. And uh, one of our leader that's here today, again, thank you. And my remarks are very brief and to the point and protect bears ears. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Jingenji, Shalak Nai, Shoji, Bernadette de Mentifoji, Kujaja Kutsan Ethwi. Good afternoon, my relatives. My name is Bernadette de Mentif, and I'm from Fort Yukon, Alaska, which is eight miles above the Arctic Circle. I want to recognize that we are on the ancestral homelands of the Piscataway people. It's truly an honor to be standing here alongside all of you, protecting sacred lands. Today, we have three generations of Guchin to show our support and solidarity to the Lummi Nation and the many tribes across the country. 
Everybody knows our sacred land as the Arctic Refuge, Arctic National Anwar, but to the Gwich'in people, it's called Ajikwatsan Gondai Gotlit, the sacred place where life begins. We carry a piece of the caribou in our heart, and a piece of our heart lies within the caribou. For thousands of years, we migrated alongside them. They are the foundation of our songs, stories, and dances. Right now, we are under attack by the fossil fuel industry, but we have an administration that can protect our human rights as indigenous people. We need Congress to act, and we need Congress to act now. Show the world that we matter, that our ways of life matter, and that the First Nations of this country will be respected. We honor Madam Secretary Deb Holland for her commitment to review and take her position seriously and for putting people before profit. We must always remind her that we have her back and we must stay strong in prayer for the protections of our land, for our water, our animals, our people, and our ways of life, which is interconnected. We are stronger together we belong together, and together we will prevail. We must do this work in a good way, but we must also remember to stand strong in who we are, and remember we come from some of the strongest people that ever walked this planet. We carry the blood of our ancestors. Be proud of who we are. On behalf of the Gucci Nation, Masit Cho. My name is Woody Lee, my Christian name. Um, that is a new sound that was given to me when I was taken to the boarding school. My mom called me Shiyajasha Aware, my little one, my baby. So there is a difference, there's two different people that how I was raised at a boarding school. So with that, everyone here, and I see that there is a lot of people here a lot of languages that are being spoken that is very heart lifting. You see the wall, you go to Walmart and you see our little Navajo kids, little Indian kids speak nothing but English. They do not know the language. That is very sad and heartening. And so with that, I hear a lot of our native tongue being spoken here this afternoon. So that is very, thank you. And then with that, we are today our answers to our ancestors' prayers knowing where we can where they came from and knowing where we are today as we have a leader that came up here as one of our nation's top leaders so with that we have strength in our prayers not only in our prayers that we have changed to our votes our votes have lift up lifted up all of our leadership within our own area with our own with our own people with demonstrating and talking to the issues of our land and so with that I do recognize and thank you to Lummi Nation for recognizing Utah to Nebuchadnezzar and its efforts to restore bear's ears. And, and today, you, a couple of years ago, you have delivered one that you have donated to the Utah to Nebuchadnezzar. And we thank you for recognizing us and standing with us and, and here forward. So we thank you and we would like to somehow in some way return the favor with that. At the same time of here, what we have today, um, we as natives, and, and every culture with here on the nation, within the country, we are told from high school, even, even through schools, that this is the melting pot of the world. I don't think so. We should not be a melting pot to where this carving, this carving what here is just be one blended color. We would like to be as colorful as it is we are today as individuals and how we identify ourselves and our identity. So with that, um, my people and everyone here that, um, Mr. Biden recognize us and help us redo this again and to restore bears ears. It is not only for us that lives in the area, but everybody that goes into the area and it's for all of us, not for, not for indigenous people, not only for indigenous people, but for all of us to know that within our younger generations that that is a place of healing to where this country has gone through a whole bunch of diversities, a whole bunch of stuff that happened that has not been very humanly. 
this is the place where we can all go to heal and move forward with that. And Ms. Madam Secretary, it is, a, it is good that you are here today with us and it is good that you are our leader as well. So with that, you know all of our, uh, the way we think and the way we talk and the way we want in, in, in our native, uh, native lands. And so with that, um, I truly am grateful that we are here today expressing who we are, where we are coming from and where we're going. With that, a hat. Yes. Okay. From the land of the Pikani, we want to thank the Lummi. Yes. Hey. The Hawaiians. You know, Sally Jewel, 2016, as Secretary of Interior helped us stave off oil and gas exploration, our sacred badger two medicine. We have John Murray, who is our historical preservation officer, I've worked diligently for the last 45 years to protect that area. That's what we're still here about doing. Don Gray's with us, legal. Dion kills back. Melissa Weatherwax, Marvin Weatherwax Council, also a state representative, and uh, Rodney Jarvis Jr., a uh, fine councilman from the Pekani. So when uh, the secretary came and spoke, it reminded me of Eloise Cabell, one of our members whose yellow bird woman that fought and got the United States to pay for the rape and pillage of our lands. That happened. There's a satellite orbiting this earth with her name on it. Eloise Cabell, yellow bird woman that fought for this land, for our people. All of us, we're connected, we're one, we're together. God made us together to come here today, to be here, to acknowledge us sacred sites all over this world where we come from. We're together, we're gonna to continue to be together, we're gonna to fight, we won't give up. We talk about the last trail here, 50 years ago, occupying Deb Holland's office down there, nonviolent. And what happened from that? The act for self-determination came about on that. Look back 20 years ago when those planes crashed into the World Trade Center. They were gonna hit this capital. 1860, when the Civil War broke out, that monument was stopped being built. One of my grandpas fought in that war. His son fought for America even though he couldn't vote. We're the last ones to get the right to vote. That mall over here for that museum, First of Peoples, the last museum on this mall. Government didn't pay for it, our people paid for that. Our sweat and our blood, our sacred honor. And then what happened on January 6th? You know, if that was us, what would have happened? Anyway, we need to continue doing what we're doing, fighting for who we are, what we are, where we come from, and where we're going. We're gonna get there. We have to do it together, or else we'll hang separately, like old Lincoln said. Anyway, we need to continue to strengthen ourselves, keep our governments going, and we're just thankful that this administration is recognizing us as who we are, the first people. What we would like to do, lastly, our tribe was responsible for two parks in the United States. We were starving when we negotiated the rocks up in Glacier Park. We received no revenue from that. But we had to do that because our people were starving. Buffalo were gone. We had to do something. So we, we got a little bit of money. We built water canals. Now that water's flowing east. And he said, water's not for sale, but yet, 1913, our chief was out here talking about that, 1903, fighting off allotments. Because we didn't believe, when you put up a fence, that's yours, this is mine. We all, God give it to us to protect it, and we did a dang good job of it until these oil extractors came in here and started. Remember 1973 EPA? The water that was on fire in Ohio? That, they protect that now. We're asking them to protect it again for us here in 2021. We need that protection. Look at what happened to us in a boarding dorm. Two of my grandfathers graduated from Carlisle. The older one right there, this eagle, his name was Pitonista, Eagle Calf. First graduate from uh, there at Carlisle. Learned survey. He actually was the guy surveyed on the park boundary in 1895. Didn't know him. And his son, like I said, uh, or his uh, son-in-law, was the one that uh, come out of Carlisle as well. 
So I went there with my daughter and my wife, and she showed me a picture of the when people burn these sacred totem poles. Very, very disheartening for me to see that, how our people were pillaged and raped and ran over by, what, the, what did they call them, the Supremes? But they weren't. You know, God put us here first for a purpose, and we protected this place for the enjoyment of all. And we continue to do that. We share. We're generous as Indian people. Three weeks over there in uh, Standing Rock, all that stuff would happen. We sent water down there during their siege of the, uh, trying to stop them, uh, exploration and the, sending that oil through polluting the lands. But anyway, we just want to thank everybody that came out and uh, look forward to working with Secretary Hall and the Congress. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do and it can be done. We've got to do it together. We're not going to be violent. We're going to be peaceful, but we're going to make it happen. We have to. We can't give up. We've been here too long to give up. Our people wouldn't allow that. So as I think of my grandparents, that my ancestors that fought for this country, and continue, we continue to fight. How about the first woman that died in that conflict, Lori Pistoa? In 2000 there, when we, the one, when we had that uh, initial war, Hopi Indian. We also had a first woman in the Marine Corps in 1940. Couldn't fight, but she could drive a Jeep, she's a sharpshooter, so, you know, in tribute to our, my mother, my grandmother, my grandmother's, all the women out there that uh, carry that sacredness of water and fight for us and where we get our nurturing from. We were appreciative of what you do for us and the men that stand there with you, behind you, for you, by you. We're together, we're one. The Creator put us here for a purpose. That purpose was to serve and protect like we do. So God bless America, God bless the natives, and God bless all people. We're together, we're one, we have to stick it together to make it better. God bless. Good afternoon. My name is Julia Bernal. I am from the nations of Sandia Pueblo and Yuchi. I am a descendant of the Trail of Tears, and we are the descendants of the 18 or 1680 Pueblo Revolt, our people's revolution against white supremacy, imperialism, expansion, land grabs, water grabs. We're here, still here, like our Auntie Deb said, and we're still here fighting to protect our cultural landscapes. We are Pueblo Action Alliance, and we have been collectively and actively working to protect Chaco Canyon and the greater Chaco region. This is a region that holds the ancestral history of our Pueblo people and remains a place of centricity for all of indigenous peoples in the Southwest. It has lineage to Bears Ears, to Mesa Verde, and our existing communities today. But for the last, uh, for the last hundred years, it has been a central place for resource extraction and sacrifice that has been supported by the federal government. This cultural landscape not only carries ancestral and traditional ecological knowledge, but it is the homelands of our Diné relatives who are directly impacted by the historical and current infrastructure to progress oil and gas operations. This region has been plagued with coal mining, uranium mining, and other resource extraction, and we stand any, against any development that destroys our lands, our waters, our people, and our culture. The carbon, the methane, the VOCs and unknown toxic emissions are emitted in this region causing generational harm and health impacts to the communities. The trucks and the presence of oil gas workers are threatening the livelihood of those neighboring the flack, fracking wells, resulting in missing and murdered indigenous relatives. The produced water spills are contaminating the aquifers and is in quickly encroaching on sacred places like Chaco Canyon. The Biden administration must address the federal fossil fuel leasing program. 
which has perpetuated adverse health impacts. The land and water are contaminated. And the, the federal mandate that the government has to indigenous people for meaningful consultation, meaningful collaboration has been ignored. So we demand consent. The administration must stop the erasure of our indigenous worldview by undermining our inherent sovereignty. The Pueblo nations have been actively advocating for our leadership to be at the table when it comes to managing cultural resources on our sacred cultural landscapes. So we must address the federal fossil fuel leasing program, invest in cleaning up the legacy of extractive industries and not put dollars towards false solutions for climate mitigation. You must also endorse free prior and informed consent and co-management strategies so that indigenous people have the jurisdictional authority over their lands. And you must continue to listen to the young people and think of us when you're making important decisions. We want to thank the House of Tears from the Lummi Nation and the organizers of this journey who have helped carry this medicine here today and help build that nation to nation unity as we indigenous people, we are the solutions for healthy lands, healthy waters and healthy communities. And we stand here before you representing ourselves as Pueblo people that we are still here and we are guests on this territory and we are guests to our earth mother and we must continue to protect her and our water mothers as well. Herkem, thank you. OCO Nagata. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Joel West Williams, and I'm a senior staff attorney with the Native American Rights Fund. And uh, NARF uh, was uh, so proud and so privileged uh, to help support uh, this, this journey of this beautiful carving uh, here to Washington, D.C., and to uh, stand with tribes across the United States uh, calling for the protection of sacred sites. Uh, NARF is a, is a nonprofit law firm, and uh, we've worked uh, uh, for more than 50 years uh, uh, on a number of issues, but the protection of sacred sites has uh, been at the core of our work, and in fact, um, a lot of the, the, the spots where, uh, uh, where this uh, journey stopped along the way are, are places where we've you know, represented tribes and, and litigated cases uh, on, these, on these issues. Um, and one of the things that, that uh, is a really troubling common theme throughout all these cases is the lack of tribal consultation. And, um, uh, you know, the, the, the remedy for that is uh, for the United States uh, to fulfill the promise in the United Nations uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and to uh, come up with a, a consultation mechanism and implement that mechanism uh, that stands on the principle of free, prior, and informed consent. Um, that that's the way that they must engage with tribal nations uh, on these issues. Um, so we will continue to work for that and we, uh, we know that uh, all of you will as well. And I wanna thank you all for, uh, for being here, uh, for the work, uh, for those that, uh, uh, that uh, gave us the blessing of this carving and, and the made, made the journey uh, here today. Uh, so thank you so much and, and know that as uh, you continue to work that uh, the Native American Rights Fund uh, will be standing with you uh, and supporting you as well. Thank you. Halito, Chaktasia, Muskogisia. I'm Tammy Tiger. I am a citizen of Choctaw Nation and descendant of Muskogee Nation of Oklahoma. But I come here today from my home in Las Vegas, Nevada, the ancestral lands of the Southern Paiute, where I work as a community organizer with the Las Vegas Indian Center. I was given permission to share the message on behalf of the people of the Red Mountain who are working to protect the sacred site Pihi Mohu from a proposed lithium mine at Thacker Pass in Northern Nevada. 
Pehimaha is translated to Rotten Moon. It's, it is the name the Paiute and Shoshone gave this site after the massacre of their loved ones over 200 years ago, leaving them in the shape of a crescent moon. The people of Red Mountain have been working tirelessly to protect Thacker Pass from excavation of sacred remains of their ancestors and have organized a camp at the site that you all are invited to join. The permit issued for this mine was rushed through without proper consultation and consent from the tribal nations in this area. If the lithium mine proceeds as planned, a massive open pit will be constructed on a site that is culturally and significantly, uh, culturally and historically significant to the Paiute, Shoshone, and Washo, people who continue to hunt, gather, and perform ceremonies on these lands. If allowed, the mining activities will import 700,000 tons of sulfur to process the lithium with hundreds of trucks running on fossil fuels. Hard rock mining is the single largest source of water pollution in the United States. This contamination will destroy the wildlife and the habitat of this area, many species that are endemic to Nevada. There must be balance with the environment as we move to a greener economy. The lithium from this mine is destined for green vehicles, electric vehicles. But mining is not clean energy and it is not sustainable. We must continue to explore scientific solutions that will not leave a toxic legacy for future generations. Please stand with me in solidarity with the indigenous people of Nevada and join the camp at Pihimuhu to protect Thacker Pass. Yakoke. Yeah. people, for my ancestors, and for my family, and my future, my grandchildren. Listen to the songs of the journey, the voices within the stories. Feel the exhaustion of the travelers, and experience the prayers and the gifts from the people and our Creator. The women of Bears Ears send their prayers, blessings, from each and every one of their hearts. We are the mothers, the daughters, the sisters, the granddaughters. We are the child bearers. We are the knowledge keepers. We are the keepers of our homes and our communities. We are, the, we are connected to Mother Earth when our umbilical cords are placed in very sacred places within her. Through the act of rematriation, we return to our origins and our life of cultural values, customs of our elders and ancestors, restoring our societies within our communities in all sacred directions of our lives. Caring and nurturing our indigenous cultures, value systems within the families and within our world. President Biden, Vice President Harris, Secretary Helen and other leaders of the nation and communities. Please understand and re receive the restoration of our traditional knowledge and protection of our Mother Earth and all that is within her. Yes, I speak of her as family because she is. I am her and she is I. From the dirt roads of our reservations and sacred journey 
of the red road, we find ourselves walking on the concrete and on the marble floors, carrying prayers and the voices from the past, present, and more importantly, the future. When times feel overwhelming and challenging, look upon the totem and reflect upon the journey, songs, voices of the women and lives along the way. Consider lending time and attention and energy in allowing for all to embrace you as a human being. The voices of our grandmothers, our, our resistance, they are our resilience as well. Through all, it carried us. Through all the songs, the dances, the prayers. To find ourselves all together here in this one sacred space and time. On indigenous homeland, a people who deserve the right to be recognized, who deserve the right to be celebrated. So give yourself a whoop and holler, the biggest clap, clap and let the world know we're here to be celebrated. Do it! <laughs> Letting the world know we are still here. We pray for our children and our grandchildren. We pray that they will live with confidence and gratitude. I thank each and every one of you for joining me. I ask and I apologize to all my elders. Forgive me for speaking out of term. Forgive me for speaking as a young person. But I really want to encourage those young ladies out there. All the young people, your voice is important. Your place will be here. When I was 17 years old, I rode a horse down Independence Avenue on the 4th of July. When I was 18 years old, the late Senior, Senator Daniel Enoway spoke to me and said, and I didn't believe it when I was that young, you will be a leader. You will return to these streets and your voice will be heard. In 2015, I found myself lobbying President Obama, fighting against the Utah delegation and being challenged by the laws and the tools and the decisions that have been made in the best interest of us without true and meaningful consultation. Where is the justice in that? When we rise, we rise loud, we rise proud. When we put our feet down, we put it upon our mother earth. When we fall, she catches us. She is who we protect. Thank you. My name is uh, Julian Matthews. I'm from the Nimipu or Nez Perce tribe, enrolled tribal member, and um, I'm not representing the tribal government or nothing. We have a nonprofit. We started Nimipu. That means the people in our language, Nimipu Temp, Nimipu protecting the environment. And I wanted to thank, I'm really so grateful and um, thankful for Freddie and his group from the Lummi tribe to bring the, we're the first stop on this journey at the Snake River. And like this sign says, um, the Nez Perce, we have a treaty with the federal government, uh, 1855 treaty with the Nez Perce, this is called, you can look it up online or whatever. And what that entails is that we ceded 11 million acres to the federal government. We didn't give it away or give away our rights. We kept, retained the rights to hunt, fish, and gather our traditional foods and medicine hunt. And so now we're fighting to, uh, we have four dams on the lower Snake River um, waterway that runs up to the um, Locksaw Selway and some of our traditional, the headwaters and our traditional lands up on the Selway, Locksaw River and other places along the Salmon. And so our big fight now is to get the four lower Snake River dams breached or removed because the salmon runs are going to go extinct. And I guess one thing I would like to say personally is uh, we actually, when we first started, our tr own tribal government wouldn't come out in support of dam breaching, but now they did. And they got a bunch of other tribes, the Columbia River tribes coming out. So that's really great. I guess what I'm getting at is a lot of times I don't feel the government is going to solve our problems. You know, I can't expect Secretary Holland or Joe Biden to come and step in and 
push some magic wand. It takes our efforts, and that's why we always work with the grassroots. We do a program with our kids, our Nespers kids, and my thinking behind that is um, sometimes when we sweat, a traditional sweat with my bros and my cousins in Lapway, one always talks about the treaty, you know, the treaty rights we have, and those signers in 1855 were protecting, for me today, um, hundred some years later, to be able to hunt, fish, and gather, just like they did. And so that's what I think of when I work with our kids at the tribe, is that I don't, I wanna, when I had gone, I told them, I'm, I, 30 years from now I could be gone, but I don't want them to say, what was Julian doing when they were, those salmon were going extinct? What was, what was your generation doing? And I don't want to be the one to say, well, we weren't doing anything. So this is our big fight out. We're out by the Snake River Runs, Washington, Eastern Washington and uh, North Central Idaho. And we have a lot of information on, we have a lot of groups helping us to bring, well, all we want is be able to take salmon from that river like we did, like my grandfather did, like my great grandfather did. And I don't want to be the one that loses it. So. I told them that I'm going to fight for this Snake River Dam removal. We're going to keep doing what we got to do and push whoever we got to push. Thanks. It's a good day to be indigenous. Amanat. 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 I'm not net the one, Alan Salazar, Uchuk Yayak, Asekfa, Chugayanga Tapu. Hello, I'm Alan Salazar, fast runner. I'll be racing after anyone wants to challenge me here. I'm from the village of Pasekfa, where I was born, where the San Fernando Mission is. For the Tatabayam village of Chagoyanga, where Magic Mountain is built. Tapu, the Shumash village where Simi Valley and the Ronald Reagan uh, uh, Library is. My sacred sites are in Southern California. Every mission in California is a sacred site. Not because of the mission, because every mission in California has a mass burial. And before I die, and if I live to be 140, I'm only middle-aged right now. Before I die, I want the missions to acknowledge all those people. The San Fernando Mission, where my ancestors are buried in a mass burial, there's a small plaque that says 2,487 neophytes are buried in this area. At the Ventura Mission where I live, there's a parking lot, over 3,000 indigenous people that died at the Buena Ventura Mission. Every mission in California has a mass burial. Those are sacred sites and we want the church to acknowledge those people. They have lists and names of all those people. Listen, I acknowledge those people built that mission for you. They built that church for you. They took care of those grounds for you. As a Shumash person, somehow my family wound up in Bakersfield. And all those jokes that Johnny Carson said about Bakersfield, they're true. And in 1995, I left Bakersfield and moved to Ventura, where my Shumash ancestors are from. And that's how I met Freddie and the Lummi people. The Shumash, the Tongva, Gabrielino, we are ocean people. We build ocean canoes. And being a person of the ocean, a Shumash, who are great fishermen, when I first moved to Ventura, I thought I should go fishing at least once. And I was sure I would catch a, a large fish. But I'm an urban Indian, so I didn't want to get my feet wet. So I went right up to the shore with my toes, right to the shore. This was the winter of 1995. It's a big year for our tribal history. I caught a fish. I caught a fish that far from the shore. It was about that big. <laughs> we didn't have enough humor today. 
I know everyone's hot, so we're gonna go traditional. I want everyone to take their clothes off. No. They're gonna regret letting me have two minutes. But I do want to finish on a serious note. I am on the elders council of the Fernandinho Tataviam Band of Mission Indians. And we are a federally non-recognized tribe. And the importance of me coming today was to give a gift to Secretary Holland because my Fernandinho Tataviam Band of Mission Indians is under review by the Bureau of Indian Affairs right now. And for the last three years, they've been going through our petition and nitpicking over this and nitpicking over that. The Shumash, the Tataviam, the Tongva have lived in Southern California for tens of thousands of years. I ask all of you pray, and no one knows who we are. When I say I'm, I'm Fernandinho Tataviam, even in the native community, they go, who in the hell is that? They go, well, we're a real small tribe from San Fernando, from Santa Clarita Valley. So please, so I can hear it once. Fernandinho Tataviam. Let me hear it. Fernandinho Tataviam. Fernandinho Tataviam. Fernandinho Tataviam. Hear it. Fernandinho Tataviam. Parents, people. Hello, everyone. My name is Becca Konomopoulos. I'm the director of the Natural History Museum, a traveling museum formed in 2014 that leverages the power of history, monuments, museums, and movements to support social, environmental, and climate justice. We are proud to be one of the organizers and sponsors of the Red Road to DC. Why are we here? We're in the midst of the sixth mass extinction. Species are dying off every minute. The impacts of the climate emergency grow by the day with wildfires, floods, droughts, and heat waves. All of these are symptoms of a way of relating to the land based on extraction, enclosure, ownership, and control, of seeing the world as made up of resources to extract, classify, commodify, and sell off to the highest bidder. This way of relating is not indigenous to this continent. It was introduced through colonization by the gun, by disease, through violence, and forced assimilation. But there is another way of relating to the land and despite efforts by colonizers and corporations to forcibly extinguish it, it persists. It thrives. It is represented here today in this crowd and with the native nations and indigenous communities the world over who are leading movements to protect water and land and sacred places from dams mining, oil and gas drilling, and destructive industrial development. And now in this time of reckoning with American history, with structural racism, as monuments to colonialism are toppling and our society is grappling with the question of what takes their place, which histories and values do we choose to carry forward? We see this totem pole as a different kind of monument, one that reminds us of the promises made to the first peoples of these lands and waters, one that shows us a way of relating to history, to the land, and to each other that we must all get behind. It is the only path forward in the context of the climate and extinction emergencies. And so we say thank you to the House of Tears Carvers to Lummi Nation, 
To all the tribal nations and indigenous groups represented here, thank you for your work, for your sacrifices that you make. Know that we stand with you. We honor the treaties. We honor your moral and inherent right to steward these lands, to decide your sovereignty and your leadership on behalf of the generations past, present, and future of humans, non-humans, the water, and the land. Thank you. Also, on a quit, Nitakam, Wapasha, Nitotam, Kashitna, Nitsky Wakin, my well in its case, Maoni, Natanaway, Makana, Keo, Saitua. My name is, uh, my English name is Guy Ryder. My um, real name is Onaquit. And uh, it means, uh, well, people say it means cloudy skies, but this old sacred medicine man told me it meant very handsome and good looking. So I'm going to, I'm going to go with that. Um, <laughs> I uh, come from uh, uh, Wisconsin. Um, I'm the executive director of an organization called Mini Konakim, which uh, roughly translates to uh, the um, organization that's building a healthy community. And uh, I come from the great Menominee Nation. I wanted to uh, just uh, bring a little bit, um, let people know that I was told once that, uh, you know, a camera adds 10 pounds and I see at least about eight cameras so I just want everybody to know that <laughs> but uh, I haven't seen so many indigenous people I thought I was at Walmart for a minute oh. Oh. they'll sing that sacred Walmart song later maybe I don't know <laughs> but uh, I wanted to just say that uh, we are uh, at home fighting a sulfide mine by the name of uh, the back 40 mine and uh, we've been fighting it for about seven years, and they're trying to build that that mine on our, our beautiful Menominee River, which is the uh, river that separates Upper Michigan and Wisconsin. And uh, more importantly, our oral history states that that's where we come from as a people. We're the longest and living inhabitants of, of Wisconsin. But um, I would uh, stand here and thank all the Lummi Carvers, all the organizations that have put this together. Thank my brothers for running security here, for all my sisters and brothers that are doing all the registering and things. Uh, I definitely want to recognize them. If we could give them all a hand. Oh. And all those uh, beautiful speakers that came before me. I'm, I'm truly humbled to be able to be here. And I'm always in constant thought of thinking about our, our beautiful relatives that line this mall, those beautiful trees here. They're so important to us, you know, this grass that we're sitting on, our beautiful mother. I just for a second want you to feel her underneath your feet. Let her know we're still here. Let her know that we're going to stand up for her, that we're going to do what we can as indigenous people, and we're not going to go nowhere. We make sure we let that building behind us know that we're always going to be here, and we're not going nowhere. Oh. So, in closing, I just want to say again, thanks to Native Organizers Alliance for, for putting this together, Illuminative. I'm, I'm very appreciative. Um, and uh, I'm going to pass this mic to my brother here, and, and he'll finish up uh, with speakers. Oh. Now, CM, Slayelton, E. Watatlam, Sunasnat. Good afternoon. My name is Jay Julius. I am uh, president of Cecila, one of the organizations who helped uh, work with House of Tears Carvers. Uh, it's an honor to be here. It's a privilege to be here before you to share a few words, to say Haishka, thank you in our language. To our elders, Haishka, thank you for all your work. Um, I, it's on my heart to acknowledge Deb Holland. I was there in 2019 when she got elected, 18 maybe. And I want to acknowledge uh, NCAI President Fawn Sharp. Fawn Sharp, a great mother. She's got an incredible son, culturally rich. And uh, all the grandmothers here, Deb Holland, Secretary of Interior. That's what Cecilia 
means in our language? All of our grandmother. And who is our ultimate mother? Who is our ultimate giver of life? Whether you're indigenous from this land, everybody's indigenous from somewhere. And when the newcomers arrived here, what is interesting is they saw nothing, nothing but opportunity to develop and said there was nothing here. But those of us who lived here for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, we had everything, everything. But Tala, money was not our culture. It was being one with. So with Cecila, with the organizations here, what this totem pole represents, maybe in Endangered Peoples Act. Endangered Species Act can stop development, can stop drilling, possibly an Endangered Peoples Act, an Endangered Cultures Act. What are some solutions that we can come forward with as we move forward into the future? Because the direction that we've gone and what has gotten us here today is not gonna work for Fawn's children, for my children, for our future generations. Catastrophic disruption has taken place and we are responsible for those youth that are here that are facing climate anxiety that our generation can't even begin to feel. We have to step up. And uh, Fawn, thank you so much for your strong words, for your strong leadership as a representative for 574 tribes. Thank you to each and every one of you. Let's invite everybody back to being one with what they call nature now. We are still one with. We still feel the pain when the orcas die, when the salmon go extinct, when the rivers are now lakes because they're damned. Everything's got a spirit. Let's invite everyone back to be in one with, one with nature. That's what's gonna take us to a future that our children can look back and say thank you. Thank you for becoming one with. Heishka for being here. Thank you for your support, OCM. Now it's him, Nishala Josiam. So here look when it's in that tacho, T Kaya Siam and Nishalacha. So Kata, it's my Indian name. It's true, my heart is glad to be here with each and every one of you. Before I speak, I would like to yield to Uncle Kimo Kale from the great Hawaiian people. You know, the Hawaiian people are battling to protect their sacred site. And Uncle Kimo Kale and Anella uh, came and joined our, our totem journey May 24th. I remember the date because we were heading down the West Coast from Hollywood Beach to Hollywood, California. And so I asked this time, I'd like to yield a few moments. As you can see, they say there's a thunderstorm coming, but you see the Hawaiians have brought the sun out. ACM. E koma koma koi kalani ono ya 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 ikono. E mahalo ya loko loko mai kai olo loko mai kai. E mahalo ke akua e no hopo mai kai. E no James Joe, no Doug Jones. E na mo opuna no Kaden Jones. Mahalo yo e na amakua. Mahalo yo e na kapuna o kai ko. Hey, mama, hey, wanoa, hey, little valley, akula. Oh, tani te po o tie tie te a tua o tavai. We pray every day upon the God Kani, Wai Olo Kani, water of life. Today is the most co important commodity to everyone. We ask Him to protect all the water rights that's been given to everyone. O tu te po o tie tie te a tua o te tawa ku stand tall strong kupono know who we are what we are what we doing and where we going with our families O rono te po o tie tie te a tua o ta o hana mai ai Lono, the harvest of the God, providing the food of life. We need the water. We need to be protected. 
So Lono can continue to grow the food of life, the sacred food. Awa kupuna. Say, hele mai no kohale. Welcome to my house. Hele mai no kamea ai. The sacred food that we grow and we serve our people to the next journey. Hele mai no ka inu kovai. The water of life. It is important really important that we know we have one commodity and that commodity belongs to all of us the sacred waters o tanaro te po o ti e ti e te atu o te tai we are ocean people we ask kanaloa to take us out to our without vaa for Akaulua, like the sailing canoe with the Polynesian Voyaging Society, Hokolea, going around the planet, serving all indigenous people about their land, their water rights, and their sacred sites. We, the canoe people, cannot go nowhere unless we have the Mauna. Mauna Kea need to be protected. Mauna Haleakala. They are the base of all the goddesses and gods to land. And we have that mountain bring the water of life from the heaven to the Mauna and the Mauna to the forest, to the farmland, and out to the ocean. Huailona, we have species out in the ocean like the Hono, the turtle. It eats upon limo ele ele, a green seaweed, knowing that there's fresh water in the ocean. Back of that is the water in the land. We thank everyone here this day, a very historical day. We thank James Jew, Doug's Jew, and their family, their grandson, Caden Jew in carving this totem pole to remind us we are one people, one nation, one cause. Water, land, and sacred rights. Mahalo. We bless this totem pole and thanking each and every one of you This water I have in my hand come from our second congressional person in Congress, Prince Kuhil, brought here by our representative, Kai Kahele, our congressional staff, Senator Schatz, Senator Meiji Hirono, Representative Case. They too have a responsibility to the Biden administration. And knowing that, we have Dev Halen, Secretary Interior spoke today and we're very thankful to the Congressional Administration of Biden protecting the land, water, and sacred sites of all nations out throughout the world. Not only United States of America, every place needs to be protected. Aloha, unconditional love, respect, care, and share. Napo Ikalani, the people of the heaven look upon us and saying that now you are responsible to take care of heaven and pass it on to the generations to come. Napo Ikamawana, the people of the ocean, care for them. They give it to you. Care for it as they have done and pass it on to the generation. Napo Ikonua, the people of the land, responsible for the land. We have the blood of our ancestors, we have the bone, and we have the flesh, each, each and every one of us. We are responsible for the heavens, the ocean, and the land. We are responsible for the land, the water, and sacred sites. Michaela Pumiana, with the greatest love of all, the indigenous nation throughout the Hunua, the earth, we are one people. Mahalo.
Aloha, Miki Aloha Pumiana, with the greatest love of all. At this time, as you can see, our relatives bring the sun out again. Uh, my Indian name is Salkadip. My government name is Frederick Lane. I would like to, uh, I guess I'm a closer. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd first like to start and um, honor our Clactamish people. Lummi is the reservation. Lummi is the reservation. We are the Clactamish people. And so I just wanted to share that. I, I wear this with honor and protection from our late beloved chief in honor of our chief Salik, in, in honor of Auntie Fran, who, who made this. And before I begin, I, I, I would like to take this moment to pay respect to those of you who've lost a loved one, to those of you that are surviving cancer, to those of you, maybe your heart's hurt, maybe you're sad, maybe you cried on our shoulder during this journey. Maybe you feel like you're not heard or respected or loved. But I just want to take this moment in honor of Telewios, Uncle Smitty, Hilaire, back at home, 
who passed away today. And I'd just like to take this moment of silence to remember all those that died at boarding schools, all those that died in their concentration camps on their reservations, all those who died fighting the good war, fighting to protect their women, their children, their chiefs and elders. I would like to take this moment of silence, if you would, please. I'd like to call up our chairman of the great Clackamish Nation, Seattle Luck, if you'd please uh, open us with our national anthem, Shishesh, we'll call it, We Are the Survivors of the Great Flood, ACM. It's with loving, honor, respect, you can take your seats, that we come here today before you. I have a prepared speech. A. It's okay, you can laugh. Let's see what kind of crowd, the Indian crowd we got. Okay, on this side, I want you to say, a, ready, one, two, three. A. Really? That's all you got? Okay, now this side, ready? Come on, I'll do them. Ready, one, two, three. A. Okay, now this side, one more time. A. And then this side, one more time. A. That's how you know you got Indians in the crowd when you hear A. 
I just first and foremost want to thank the ancestors and our creator, whoever you believe in, God, by any other name, in our beliefs, all of our tribes, we call the creator. The creator brought us here today, 22,000 miles later, we still have to drive back home. But when we go home, we're gonna remember each and every one of you, from the youngest to the oldest, each and every one of your prayers, your good thoughts, your good words. I'd like to thank all the speakers that spoke before me. I learned over the last 20 years with the House of Tears and Uncle Sidki Kadam in 2002 after 9-11, you might remember the healing pole and the honoring pole and the freedom and liberty pole. That was the vision of the House of Tears Carvers at Lummi Nation. We're so humbled to be here, to finally bring the ancestor here. The beloved over 400 years old there was a lady just a few stops ago. I believe we were at Chaco Canyon. And she told me, she told me about when she put her hand on the pole. And she said she seen and felt all those missing and murdered indigenous children of the boarding schools and the residential schools. She said that what you guys are doing is right in bringing the attention of the atrocities of the American Holocaust. Hitler, in World War II, if you know your history, based the concentration camps on the American Indian reservation system. I'm thankful each of you paid tribute to those ancestors whose blood runs through your vein today because our ancestors knew that we were coming. Let's give the ancestors a round of applause, please. <laughs> the invisible ones standing all the way around us all across this great nation we call home. But democracy is at stake. Right behind me, if you know or seen up close, I watch Ancient Aliens, so they talk about these things. Do your research on the lady that stands at the top of this sacred site. Do your research on what she's based on. The feathers that come down on the top, right up there. Why is it a woman? You should know this because the women are the life givers of this earth. The woman up there stands as a symbol as a representation of what democracy is by our relatives just north of here. If you know your American history, American history begins with the American Indian and that is, it has to change. I graduated from Chamawa Indian School. It's the, oldest continuously operating boarding school in the country and I have to say I'm proud because Chamawa saved my life. Chamawa allowed me to sit with Seattle leading the people and even though I didn't win my re-election this last Halloween it didn't stop me from being a community leader it didn't stop me from talking and fulfilling the dream 
with Teresa, Sheldon here, Tulalip tribes. We're just a cornerstone. Each of you are a stone in what we're building. We're building back our resilience. We're, we're building back our languages. You can't say you don't understand when things come full circle. When you see our languages coming back, you see our customs coming back, you see our relatives weaving and creating beautiful regalia like in ancient times. Your ancestors are proud of you. Your ancestors are standing behind you. You have to recognize and love their sacrifice because they knew that this day in the 21st year of the 21st century that this would happen to Indian country to bless us with our strong women warriors like President Fawn Sharp of NCAI, like our strong women warriors all across the nation. They say behind every great man, great chief is a very powerful woman. In ancient times, our Clactamish people, the women held the power. The women, the men would drop a tree in ancient times, delimit, delimit. And it was the women in our, in our stories, in our oral tradition. And the women would line up young and old, great grandmothers, grandmothers, aunties, sisters, nieces, they lined up on each side of the, of the tree when it was dropped. And the women sang their song. And after the fourth verse, this is what my auntie Mary Plaster told me. She told me to never forget it, how powerful our Clactamish women were. And after the fourth verse on that song, the women would put their hands above the, t above the tree, the sacrifice, and the power of our women would levitate and lift the tree. And the tree, they would walk the tree down to the village where they would construct the canoe. So these are just a uh, that's just a glimpse of this great time that that we're all in. I can't I can't go without thanking the the James brothers, Uncle Doug and and Sidki or Sasia, Jewel James. I have to thank Judith LeBlanc of Native Organizers Alliance and our friends at the Natural History Museum. I wanna thank all those that helped us get this far. And to remember that M Uncle Emerson, thank you, thank you. I wanna thank Karina Lopez right here, Rachel and her mom, Suzanne. Karina's on the San Leandro City Council, took care of us kept us for four days in the Bay Area. Rachel and Suzanne Anderson helping us bring awareness to the our whale that's incarcerated. All of you wonderful and beautiful people that have come here to help honor and, and, and respect and remember Remember, somebody loves you. Remember that you're here and it's a sacred, you're a sacred being. You know, it's tough talk, you know. Some of the communities that we went into where suicide was out of control. And as a two-spirited man and a survivor, 
it's important to take these moments to let you know that we love you, we honor you, we respect you. I'd just like to conclude by saying that your democracy is at stake. And this sacred house was desecrated on 1621 in our lifetime. Remember, you have the power, you have the voice. You can be a congressman, you could be a senator, you can run for your public office. Your grandma, do you think we're doing this for us in our generation? We're the first generation to recognize global climate change and we're the last generation that could do something about it. Do something about it, speak up, bridge your communities and remember that all of us, all of our relations, each of you are family. Each of you have a reason and a purpose and to live it. If, you're so if you say you're sovereign, live it, breathe it, exercise it. And my words to Secretary Holland, we love you. We're gonna continue to help you to care for you, to bring reason, and, and to bring some solutions to hopefully make the future better for each and every one of you. On September 1st, if you're moved, we haven't had canoe journey in a couple years, but September 1st through the 5th, we'll invite you over. It's just going to be an encampment, but the canoes will come in on September 1st, so if you do come to Lummi, look me up and we'll take care of you in a good way. High school Siam and Ashalacha. Nobody told you they loved you today. Well, we love you from Lummi Nation. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. There is food and snacks still in the tents. Please take it with you. Travel safely. Good night. All right. Can I go interview Judith? Yeah. All right. We got to go and get interviewed. Touch the pole if you want. Yeah, touch the pole. I haven't, I literally have not done this yet. Yes, I haven't done it either. We'll have a final blessing. We'd like, to do, uh, we'd like to do one final blessing. If we could, come forward. You have to look. We're going to offer one final prayer. Good thought. Come all the way around. Come all the way around, we'll do one final prayer. ACM.
Hi, Judith. Can we sit with you for a moment? Yes, please. Let me stand up, though. Of course. It's been like such a long day. Relax. It's Miller time. <laughs> <laughs> you are too young to know what that really means. Come on. It's been such a beautiful day. Yes, amazing. Can you reintroduce yourself and just let us know how you're feeling? That was just such a powerful moment. It's been a powerful day. Mm -hmm. So where should I be looking? Okay. My name is Judith LeBlanc. I'm a citizen of the Caddo Nation of Oklahoma and the director of the Native Organizers Alliance. Just let us know how you're feeling oh, about today. How I'm feeling. I am uh, feel very emotional because the Red Road to D.C. was both a cultural, a spiritual, and a political journey. And we wove together the strategies of leading with our values, leading with our beliefs and our inherent rights to be caretakers of Mother Earth. And we've been able to galvanize 17 tribal nations, many grassroots community organizers, and traditional people. That is not easy to do. There's always so much that, that separates us. But the only way that we can win transformational change in Indian country is to weave together all those who put in the center of the circle our continued... Uh, 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 the only way... Uh, oh my God. All the emotions we have. Yeah. The only way that we can continue in a good way is to put all that matters in the center of the circle, remembering that it's a circle and each of us have a role. You know, the Native Organizers Alliance is a national organizing and training network, and we join this journey in order to support the House of Tears Lummi Carvers, because they, we knew that with this strategy of culture and leading with our values, that we could do some healing, some bridging, bringing people together in their communities to talk about the state of play and the negotiations with the federal government, but even more so to strengthen the relationships, the ecosystems that are supporting the protection of all of these sacred sites. I don't think there's a clear solution for every single sacred place, but I do know there's one common denominator, and that is the role of the federal government the role of the federal government to ensure that we're sitting at the decision-making table that we have, as they say in the United Nations, prior informed consent. And frankly, it's better for everyone if we're on that footing. It's better for democracy, but we'll also come up with the best solutions to the kind of duress 
that land and water in our sacred places have been under. Yes, thank you. And, and how do you see the Respect Act playing into that? Ah, you know, when, when you look at our histories and how our ancestors came together to do the impossible sometimes, to face terrible conditions, there was always strategy and tactics. The strategy, how. I think what we do is as important as how we do it. And so, in order for us to reach that horizon of tribal sovereignty, a full inherent and legal right to caretake our land and water, and to participate in the governance of this country, we have to start where we're at. And the Respect Act is an excellent way to start down that path, to give the Congress and the administration an idea of what is the system that's needed to ensure consultation. What is the system that's needed by in every department that will guarantee tribal input from start to finish of any decision that affects our health and well-being. So we're going to make a huge push to build a grassroots support for the RESPECT Act, get it introduced into the Senate, and see it as one way to do public education about prior informed consent including our, our, our congressional representatives. They need to understand their role in ensuring treaty rights because, as Faith Spotted Eagle from the Braveheart Society said, we're all treaty signers. All the white people, all the Indian nations, we're all treaty signers and we're responsible for the fulfillment of those consensual agreements. Sometimes we signed treaties because we were forced to, or we wanted to live to fight another day. But there were many treaties that were signed that made an agreement between two equal partners. That's what Mother Earth needs right now. We need to work together. Thank you, Judith. You've been such a huge part of this event, of organizing and speaking to this administration. We thank you so much. Thank you. Absolutely. I love Indian. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you all came. All right, we're gonna look. I'm gonna go on the stage and see if I get yelled at. But we're gonna go look at the totem pole from above. Let's go. Again, thanks for joining us. I know some people were mentioning that the camera was a little shaky. I apologize. That is definitely my bad. I have my shoulder rig. I did not have any good stabilizing equipment to be standing in one place. So that's what happened. Here's the totem pole. We've looked at it a few times. of it. All right. Um, what do you want to do while talking about yells? Hmm. All right. I mean, maybe the carvers? Yeah, where are the It'd be cool to like, talk to the carvers for a second. Let's see. But I don't know. Definitely a powerful day. Yeah. All right, well, uh, everybody want to play? We want to try to find the carvers? I think we're okay. We're good? Do you know who they are? Like, would you recognize them if you saw them? Um, yeah. Just out of town. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today at the final stop on the Red Road to D.C. totem pole journey. It was a powerful and beautiful day. We just closed out in an, an amazing prayer. All of our hands on the totem here to the left. Thank you all for joining in. There's lots of good energy happening today and hoping everyone 
who has joined in, everyone here can carry that energy with them and that we can definitely speak to this administration and get them to take some action. If you're not already doing so, make sure to follow Indian Collective on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. Subscribe. Thank you.